California Day. I'm Ricky Johnson, and welcome to the 2023 SRT Off-Road King of the Motos. I'm Ricky Johnson, Brian Pierce, along with Brian with uh, Chris Johnson. Now, guys, we got a lot to talk about. The prologue this morning got, was biting some people. Some people thought it was a little smooth, like Cody Webb and some of the other guys, but some of the results we didn't quite expect. So, Brian, uh, Brian what, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so we saw Will Reorgan uh, come out with the win there. It looks like he had 424 for that time in the two miles of the section. And then, of course, second there, Cody Webb. So seeing Will come out in front of everybody, pretty stinking awesome for Will. But in the long run, we did hear a little bit that Cody, Tristan, and a couple other guys might have gotten off course. So if they did, that's, a, that's lucky for Will. But in the long run, this is a GPS race. And so they need to make sure that they're watching their GPS. Exactly. And, and uh, Chris, we talked with, with Cody quite a while, and he said, if you qualified in the top 15, you can still win this race. There's still a really good opportunity of being able to, do, to finish in the top honors. And, uh, we apologize for the feedback. A little bit of feedback here. There we go. I think we got it set. Okay, so in talking with Cody, that was a great, great interview with Cody, by the way. And he's so awesome in, in regards to extreme enduro all the way back to Enduro Cross and all the way back to, to his trials career as well. But uh, some of these rocky up crop, croppings and stuff, he put his trials work in order and he's able to motor up that. But he said that he he got off course with a couple of the riders and that's why his time was back a little bit. Well, Brian, he was also saying that the level of competition over the past couple of years is, is, is more than doubles. He was just saying that back in the day when he first came out and won, he said he was just kind of riding around picking his way through and he won he says now this current crop we got we got a few names that we want to go over uh cooper abbott uh tristan we got uh, you know uh colton who's a, an older you know not an older guy but he's been here a while right so we we have a lot of guys that we expected to be there and some that we didn't but back to the back to my original thought is cody was telling us how much this sport has excelled and then on your podcast and all the coverage that you do there's all these names coming out of the woodwork. Yes. So if we think about it, Cody Webb won this event, King of the Motos, in 2013. That was 10 years ago. That was his first win. So he's now the older rider, right? Yeah. We have all of the kids that watched Cody Webb win 10 years ago for the first King of the Motos for, him, for his first win. And so now that's his competition. We've got Ryder LeBlanc, of course, Will Riordan. And then we have saw, we, what was it, with Cooper Abbott, you mentioned Daniel Lewis on the beta. But then we see David Camo in there too. So one of our old dogs, of yeah. course, trying to trying to keep in the top ten. So the guys that watched Cody Webb win ten years ago are now his competition, and the, he's got to stay up to up to speed. So Chris, if you had to call if you had to call the race in your little fantasy league, how do you think it's going to go? Who's going to get that that whole shot, and who do you think is going to lead the first couple miles? I think both Will Reardon and uh, Ryder LeBlanc are really really hungry to do to to put some notches on their guns. Yeah. I really think, and they're the young guys. They're the young guns coming up through the pack. Of course, you know, Cody and, and Cooper. Cooper's getting up there, too. He's not quite the young, youngster he was a couple of years ago. But then, of course, Cody, on top of that, uh, they're all getting up there. And these kids are really starting to show their show the roads. Well, and I think they're all in great shape, and they all have a plan. But if it were me, and I'm not, um, I would want to sit about third or fourth but not lose track of the leader. Because if someone breaks away, they can really do some damage. But the, that, I, I don't know if I'd want to be the front with that strong of a pack right behind me because now I'm adjusting and those guys can watch your line, see, when the, see where there's a, a buck or this or that. But we really don't have a lot of wins, so the dust could become a factor, Brian. Yeah, so what we saw in the prologue where they were going 30 seconds apart, right? So they had that distance between the riders. What we're going to see here in race one is we're going to have 30 to 40 riders starting in that land rush style format. So to your point, they are going to be on top of each other as they go up that first hill. So if they're right on each other's rear wheels, the dust could get bad and they were going to have to kind of settle into a pace. But again, race one, their time is just where they're going to start in race three. So if you're not out front and you're fighting dust, it's probably okay, for the pros anyway, to still sit in that top five, top ten, and know that they're at least going to be on that first row for the big race tomorrow. Well, Chris, every year we always, you know, one of the promoters comes in, like Jimmy Lewis before when he was laying out the course, he said, oh, I expect him in this. And they always obliter you know, obliterate whatever time, the, you know, the guy laying out the course puts. Um, 
that just shows me that the guys are confident in their conditioning, they're confident in their bikes, and and the way and the way the way it's rolling. So I don't. So you think it's going to be reared, reared and it's going to take off and, and go for the whole shot? But remember, they get to pick their spot. Maybe he did not quite get the you know it, to get off the gates one thing, but to get to the top of the hill is another. Lane choice is really important right now, and there's limited amount of decent lanes that are going up the hill off the start here. So what's going to happen? They're going to be some bottlenecks coming into these lanes, trying to fight for that top lane position as they get to the top. Whoever gets to the top first is going to have a good, clear sailing from there. But on the, the other aspect, they got to look at their GPS to make sure they're going the right direction for this next 12 laps or 12 miles. Exactly. And so, Brian, everyone might, at home might be watching on 12-mile race on a motorcycle. What What is that? That, that can't be that difficult. Well, let me tell you, folks. Just educate the world on a little bit on what these guys are what these guys are going to be seeing. Yeah. So what we saw in the prologue was a two-mile course, right? We saw the fastest guys going in that four to five-minute range. So what's going to happen is the courses are going to get more difficult as we go through. So race one and then the race two. But they're also using their GPS. So what has to happen is not only are they needing to technically clear these obstacles, carry that momentum to make sure they get up and over, but they have to get to the top, check their GPS, make sure they're not that 25 feet off of the track that they're supposed to be, because they do have to re-enter where they came off if they do get off course. So there are so many dynamics that come into this that it's not, I'm in the desert, I can go as fast as the bike wants to because of the CCs I'm on. It's much more about, okay, this is a very technical course, and I need to make sure that I'm riding the course to keep my momentum so that I can focus on my GPS and where that I'm headed for the course. Well, and, and Chris, talk about the, there are sections where they expect bottlenecks, and they put alternate routes. So in, there might be a place where you see the people moving off, looks like more than 25 foot off. Well, in those sections, they have made it wider for the riders that, that don't get stuck. But there's also the issue of some of the slower riders who actually help each other up through these bottlenecks. But I'm taking a look at this now. You know, the, the top riders coming through trying to get away from everybody else so they don't have these bottlenecks to deal with. But in the same token, you don't want to be the top three. Right. Well, no, I, I, as I said, I, I think that my race strategy, if I were doing it a long time ago, would be to try to stay in that top five group and watch and see what anybody does. But if somebody does try to make a breakaway, that, that's who I'm going to go after and try to watch them. But I don't know if I would, I don't know if I want to race because I want to save some energy because tomorrow is going to get more difficult mentally and physically on both your motorcycle and the riders. Yeah. So take it for example, 25 riders DNF this first, just the prologue. Yeah. And our last rider that did finish, finished an hour and three minutes for two miles. Yeah. So it's well, if they added us on there, there would have been three more riders that did not finish the prologue. Well, it, that, it, that, <laughs> let's go, maybe for you guys, let's, I, I would at least try to finish. Well, I would have tried. I mean, there, there's a difference <laughs> between trying try. and, and competing. I think the capability would have been there for all of us. But as we said, so we got five minutes before before the, the green flag drops. Um, the, the rec a record number of, of riders entered here. I mean, this is pretty awesome. We had we raced two years ago. We haven't been back. We weren't back last year, but now we're back again. So this is awesome because you guys you guys are the experts and you see all the other series. So how does this compare to the arena cross, to the work series, to all the different stuff? I'll start with you, Chris. Well, work series we get you know 12 to 1400 entries, but the arena cross and enduro cross they get a couple hundred entries. And, and that covers that's similar to what we have here. It's 180 entries for this event this weekend. And Brian, so we we have three different series that this is their opening round. Right. So some guys are competing against each other, but some guys are in a different series and stuff. So will there be some strategy to say, hey, if we get first and second, that basically puts us one and one for our collective series. But yeah. so so talk a little bit about that, the different series that this this. This is the beginning and they're moving on. Right, so if you take it really far back for hard enduro in the United States, you'd go to the Tennessee Knockout, and that event has been going on for a ton of years now. But what never really happened is we never had a series, right? These racers never had, they wanted that AMA championship, a series to follow. And luckily enough, 
as this sport has grown in the states they've gotten that so the u.s hard enduro came together and has really grown and this is the first time that king of the motos has been the start of that series and so i think what we're seeing and why so many racers have come to this event not just because of the caliber of this event specifically but because of the growth of the sport of hard enduro in the united states and the fact that they're so excited to have a series to be able to follow to be out there with their fellow riders competing themselves competing with them and of course with themselves in the course because it's the technical nature about hard enduro that really pumps up I'll even say it, older riders like myself to be out there and challenge ourselves on those courses versus, you know, how you uh, awesome people back in the day would really just hold it as wide open as you could. It's but just a, a different, different style. That was a completely right? different right. environment. When you're racing motocross, you practice. You know, they take the rocks off the track. If there's a problem, they try to fix it before the moto. Same in Supercross. It does get a little bit of wear and tear and a little bit of rust. Right. But this is dealing with the elements. And it's one of the things that Cody Webb said is that going with the, the 140 tire, more traction, l l smaller knobs, they don't roll over as much, all the different things. Cody looks for the rocks, doesn't try to go around them. And like myself and a lot of other riders, they try to go around them, they're intimidated by them. But with guys with the trials background, you'll see, will use the rocks yeah. to their advantage. That's where the traction is for these guys, right? They're using these gummy tires and they're using the bike and the momentum to make sure that they find the traction. And if they go off to those silty sand areas, that's where they can lose traction. So the goal for them is to try to find sure. traction. We're trying to get, so. <laughs> We're trying to avoid a little base. All right, we are now about one minute until the green flag drops. So we're going to go probably get ourselves ready and get into the booth. We're going to, the beginning, it's going to be you and I, Brian. So right. if you had to, you have to bet, who's your top three? Oh, coming out of this for sure. I really do. I'm so proud of Will for what he did, but I really do think we're going to see Tristan Hart. We're going to see Cody Webb. And I want to put either Ryder LeBlanc or Cooper Abbott. I think as we were talking about the Young Bucks coming up, they do have something to prove. I don't think that they're going to be looking for what's going to happen tomorrow. I think they want to be up there. All right, top three. You're top three, Chris. Colton Haker. Okay. Cody. Okay. And then possibly one of the young guns. Either Will Reardon, Ryder, or Cooper. I'm going to go Young, old, you old. Yeah, old. I'm going to say Tristan Hart for first. Cody Webb's going to maintain second. I'm going to bring in uh, Cooper Abbott for third. I think I think the three of those, and as we, we've seen in the past, we, we saw uh, Tyler Roberts go down in just kind of a basic place, but went off a little bit, dropped his front wheel, endowed his brains out. Um, this race is, is also unique that they do, it's not just the slow stuff. They have some fast desert that they have to, to contend with as well. So we're going to see very shortly, it's going to be dropping any moment. So we'll, we'll probably throw it over to the guys and watch the start. We'll be right back with you. Spread this around, spread the link, tell everybody King of the Motos is definitely on. Alrighty, we are here, the 2023 King of the Motos, and the start has happened. In, in the translation, we missed this, the start, Brian, but right now the guys are off and moving. We see not a lot of bottlenecks. Everyone's moving along. Yeah, so the start that they had, that nice land rush, I know that you guys got a chance to watch it. So going uphill, that was one of the coolest things that I see, saw. I got a chance to walk over there. There were a couple of established lines, but in the long run, those guys were just going to have to send it to see who could get to one of those lines first. And then the downhill that we're seeing was at the very top of that uphill. They had to take that hard right-hand turn around the camera and drop their way back down. Now, again, in a situation like this from the start, there were a lot more arrows on course. But as we're seeing right now, they take this hard left at that ditch at the bottom 
that's really where the GPS sp support of this race starts to kick in. And we've mentioned, too, that this race is a little bit more GPS supported than last than the la than the prologue. And, of course, race three will be a much more GPS needed. Yeah, as you can see, some of the riders have already gone down, and now they're starting to work their way through there. Um, they got to start looking for alternate lines, but they're, it, you know, when it comes to that 25 foot, you are not going 25 foot off of this course because uh, you got to think about it. Who Somebody would want to? was Look the original, this. and right here we see a little bit of a bottleneck. Guys starting to go, and you see all the officials off to the side. They cannot help those riders unless it becomes extreme. Or they're hurt and they're just going to be ending their day. So you see these riders working their way up, duck walking their way up, sitting on the back looking for traction, trying to keep themselves moving forward. So what we t when we talked to Cameron Steele, he said the same thing. As soon as he got going, he kind of nutted up, was was you know got got tight and wasn't breathing. And next thing you know, he was kind of huffing and puffing as you go. But you got to think of all the energy that it takes running up that hill. So look at the dust that we're seeing, right? That's one of the things that you brought up earlier, Ricky, is that. At the, if the further in front you can get, the less dust that you're going to have to contend with. And what we were also seeing here on the start right now is look how loose it's already getting. So this is probably the third or fourth row to go off. So there were 30 to 40 bikes per row before this one. So all of the rocks are now moved. All of the silty sand is in the way. And, of course, now there are bottlenecks. So the chance for you to even carry any momentum has been completely amplified. Well, I think if I was in you know, maybe one of the last two rows, I might just wait and just let, you know, let some of the traffic cuz and cuz I don't want to utilize I don't want to use all that energy for later on in the race and I'd rather give up maybe a couple minutes and sit and rest and then find a clean way through rather than go. But the competitor inside you says, no, I got to go, got to go, got to go. And that's what we're seeing right now. Guys trying to work their way around, trying to find their way up that hill. And you can see how steep it is and how broken up the dirt is becoming. And it's kind of that silty, chalky that's really, really tough on it. Yeah, that's the, honestly, being that this is race one after the prologue and we have race two tomorrow. And this race is only going to give you a position for the race for race two tomorrow if you are in that b or c class and you know you're not going to be on that front row that might not be a horrible strategy to hold back a little bit let everything die down and kind of see a line give it a go and make your way up the start here at that the is if of your goal one. is to finish if you're trying to right. finish and, and because there is a certain amount of time that, that you if you lose and they close that section you're going to be done for the day so you can see right now the guys are all bottlenecked in there and tight and if you go to one side or the other so now here we go it looks like we have cody webb is the first one it looks like tristan looks like a red bull helmet's next and this is the deal desert racing they go a little bit off to the left or to the right so it looks like we now have tristan and this is a guess i'm taking a long shot here that is now to lead with with uh, Cody Webb looks like that tall um, tall riding style on the shirt tall shirt lanky Cody Webb yes he uses his body angles and everything well but that those are your leaders you can see once we get a little bit closer or we get some tracking advice or tracking uh, tips we'll let you know who is in front and who is, is uh, who is in second I liked how right when they got to that checkpoint they checked in but you could see them immediately look at their GPSs. So they went, their eyes went straight to their handlebars to say, okay, cool, we made it to this checkpoint. I think that we should head that way. But again, we have to verify if, the, if they get off course from the GPS, there are penalties involved. Absolutely. And then you can see if they get off to the left or to the right, there, there might be a line. But also it's something that has not been run. So there's sometimes some big surprises. So you can't really be adventurous you know, during a race unless you have to. Now, if there's a bottleneck or if there's some dust that you can't see, you're better off rather than stopping, move to the left or to the right. But right now, the, the trails are established. They're just not that broken in. As you can see... We got more bottlenecks on the downhill. Oh, look at that downhill. This at this point, it's just single file, single file heading on down. Well, it, it, I think the riders in, in that case just need to go. Okay, I'm not going anywhere. Slow down, yep. breathe, relax, get my try to get my heart rate down. Try to get some, you know, take a drink of water. Make sure that I, I keep everything going. But you can see the dust is hanging very, very, very tight. So we don't have a lot of wind out here. We, we're looking at the flags. I'm gonna say maybe. Five mile an hour winds, so really not a lot of wind. And when you get in these little valleys, it just kind of hangs. Yeah, you're right. Those single file lines that you can get in is the perfect chance to realize this is not my chance to push it and not freak out that I'm stuck behind people. That might be that time that you can say, okay, I'm going to regroup here. 
take the sip of water that you mentioned, or maybe even just say, okay, I'm going to breathe in through my nose, I'm going to breathe out through my <laughs> mouth, and slow down that heart rate, because you know you're going to need to be able to breathe a little bit harder and a little bit more on the next obstacle that you hit. Check out this awesome uphill that we've got. I believe that that looks like Tristan Hart there on that Red Bull yeah, KTM. That's the Red yep, Bull there's KTM. the number one. Absolutely. So Tristan Hart, he takes a look back and he's keeping it going. So that's what we talked about is a rider, is, is he going to try to break away? And that's exactly what Tristan Hart is trying to do right now. Yeah, so Tristan Hart, our 2021 King of the Motos winner. As we mentioned earlier, we did not have a 2022 King of the Motos. But so super thankful to be back here at King of the Hammers. And look at that. So there was a trail there to the left, but he decided to make sure that he just went straight for the rocks to get the shortest route possible because this is the race, race number one after the prologue that will give them their start placement for race number two tomorrow, which is going to start at Chocolate Thunder, which is going to be an 8 a.m. staging, 9 a.m. start time, and they are going to be going directly up Chocolate Thunder, which is even more gnarly than what we just saw these racers start for race number one. Now, if you're a rider and you're learning – Pay attention. You're wa you're watching one of the world's best, and watch how he you know he he's not standing all the time. He's saving energy where he needs to. But now through this tight technical stuff, it's better off to get up on your legs, slightly bent knees, slightly bent body. Everything is relaxed and, and just move along and feel traction. So he's not fighting the bike. So we're not going to see a bunch of arm pump out of Tristan Hart. Yeah, what I'm also is making me feel better as a uh, as a middle pack rider is that he's dabbing. That at least makes me feel like he's human <laughs> and that it makes me feel okay as a rider that it's, you know what, even the top hard enduro racers uh, dab and just to keep that momentum going. He's going 40 miles an hour. You're going 15. There's it's a difference. similar. It's very a, similar. But I dab and, that's, and he dabs and so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is not like a dance floor. It's a completely But just think game. about this. Who is the person that decided this was the idea, right? There's this side of a hill with all these rocks, I'm gonna go ride through those, right? Like that's the thing. And look at these big boulders that he's gotta make his way through right now. Yep, as he works his way up. And now we're watching some of the riders that are further back. They're still working to get over the first two sections of hills. So um, it is gonna be a long day for those, for those individuals. But as we're watching our leader, Tristan Hart, as he gets back up and goes and that's the thing you know you do a lot of this i did i did some of it back back when i used to race moto but i, I don't dare mess with it now you're gonna fall down you're gonna tip over you, if you're the best at it you watch graham jarvis you watch you know all these different guys you tip over and you fall that's part of riding a motorcycle yeah and the most the, one of the things that we practice the most when out practicing hard enduro is how to regain your momentum because you said it. We do fall down. We don't clear an obstacle. And when that happens, you have to do what we already talked about. You have to take a break. You have to take a breath, get your heart rate down, reset. So a lot of times, too, you take that quick look at your rear tire just to make sure it's not even sitting on a loose rock. And then it's all about body position, clutch, and throttle control to, again, get that bike to start moving. And once it's moving, dig that rear tire in and try to keep that momentum. Climbing. And we talked with Cody about running, does he run a recluse clutch and stuff. And he said that he doesn't, he runs the one, he runs the ones, the manual recluse yep. because he wants to be in control with that clutch and throttle to hit the, exactly his, his point here. We see some bikes already starting to overheat. That is not a good thing. This rider keeps going back and forth. He better get some air to that bike quick or yes. she's going to blow. So a lot of these uh, hard enduro riders will have fans on their bike. So when they uh, reach a certain temperature, the fan will kick on. But again, that fan will blow air through the radiator. So as the engine is still running and all that radiator fluid is moving through the engine and the radiators that it tries to cool it down. Again, that only works so much. To your point, these guys have to keep the bike moving in a forward position to get that airflow through the radiators. That's really not enough. First place is, as we talked about, first place is Tristan Hart. Next where is Cooper Webb, Ryder, and then uh, Cody. So um, right now it is a – and Will Reardon is, is, follow, is following the top five. So with all, all the guys that we said and qualify top five are out there, but – it's still settling in. We see Tristan trying to break away, trying to get away from him. Um, if he can get whoever's in second place, which I think is, is Cody Webb, um, <clears throat> what he's got to do is, is hope that he can hold those other guys up and, and make some time. Yeah, so Cody right now is going to need to be in, in catch-up. He needs to make sure that he does not let Tristan Hart get out, of, get out of his vantage point. But then again, we were talking about the young guys, Ryder LeBlanc, 
Cooper Abbott, they're probably super excited. They're like, hey, I am keeping the past winner in sight, and I want to get a chance to either try to beat him or at least stay on his tail so I can gain that confidence throughout the real realizing I can ride with Tristan Hart. He's not leaps and bounds faster than I am. We're right there. Nope, they were looking at some of the uh, the quick straps being used here and the riders helping each other. Well, that... <laughs> That, that's your bro right there. Guess who's buying dinner on the way home? But as we as we watch Tristan, we don't exactly know the gap that he has on everybody, but Tristan Hart is our current leader. Looks like Cody Webb is second. Um, we got, uh, I think, Colton and also Cooper Abbott. Also, all these guys in Ryder uh, LeBlanc out there as well. So here, once again, we're watching Tristan Hart as he works his way through, and you can see that he is not followed real closely. So... There's I see some dust up ahead, but this is our current race leader, Tristan Hart. Yeah, I'm excited for for Cooper Abbott because with Cooper Abbott last year was able to sign on to that factory Sherco team. So he was able to go from a factory supported team to a factory team. Same thing for Ryder LeBlanc. Ryder LeBlanc has been on a factory supported Husqvarna team. Now he was able for 2023 and 2024 to sign a two-year deal with the factory Husqvarna team. So he is actually a team teammate now with Colton Haker. So that's great to see for these young guys getting the support that they need to become better and better hard enduro racers. But these guys just aren't hard enduro racers. A lot of them also compete in enduro cross. Yeah. So it's cool to see because sometimes that crosses over and sometimes it doesn't. As we're watching Tristan, that's Tristan, correct? No, that's not Tristan. So no, Tristan had some of the Thor gear on and a, those white backgrounds, but I can't, we can't get that exact number going on there. But in the long run, it's awesome watching him be able to flow through this rocky terrain, this cool single track out here in the desert. And that's the thing. The constant motion forward is what we're looking for. You want to, if you try to go too fast, you end up hurting yourself and you end up, you know, digging a wheel or, or you know, having a major problem. It's getting that flow, getting in the zone and what they what's amazing what these guys can do is and girls that are out there is just micromanage so many things so the, the so this is where ADD pl <laughs> plays off as a huge advantage because you you're seeing everything you're seeing every rock every bush every corner every dip every hill all the different stuff and you watch his body is one step ahead not one step behind so if this is i think it's it might be i think this might be Tyler no Potentially Will Reardon, but again, it's tough yes, to I'm get sorry, that number yeah, yeah. there to kind of like see what which rider we're looking at. But this was you earlier in the prologue, Ricky. You guys were talking about looking ahead. The way that this trail is set up is perfect for that, where you have a good 50, 60 feet in front of you that you can see. So you are obviously trying to look as far down the trail as possible so that you can set up for whatever potential obstacle could be coming. And it looked like for him, it was about to be a ginormous uphill. Exactly. And what? And also, it was it was pretty cool to see him jump in and put his camel back in his mouth and start start drinking and just watch how smooth and how little dust that's the throttle and brake control that we see that's will yeah that, that's, that's definitely 39 will reardon nice work so his younger brother is a west coast racer as well doesn't do as much hard enduro but he is a very very fast up and coming racer on the west coast Amazing. These are the still shots that we have. As, as, as Brian was saying, we have <clears throat> drones, we have helicopters, and we also have the stationary cameras that are up on there. And you can see how far we are away from Hammertown, but you still see photographers out there that just keeping an eye on everybody. And you can see this is where the, the front gap has separated themselves quite a bit um, from the rest of the field. And it's awesome with King of the Hammers uh, to have – us a part of their event right we would not be able to have as much as we have without king of the hammers and allowing a king of the motos to be such a big part of that so huge thanks to king of the hammers which of course kicks off next week which you'll be here giving yes. all of the feedback and talking to all the people on the internet about all the great racing that's going to be going down well in, in the the production this race and uh, as well as the mint 400 have up the the ante when it comes to coverage the fact that we're watching a live motorcycle event in the middle of the, of the, the california desert live not it's not delayed it's not 20 minutes it's not 10 minutes it's not 10 seconds it's actually live and we're going from camera to camera to camera and it's pretty amazing and that and that is i was talking to him this morning with dave cole he is a relentless 
man, when it comes to this and wanting it to be better and better and seeing the way, the way it is and how clean the desert is and how well uh, all these all these spectators and racers represent, uh, you know, our, our brand and our, our sport, it's awesome. Alrighty, folks, we have lost signal on the camera for a little bit. We will be right back on that, and here we go. We're starting to see some of the drones, but <clears throat> that is some of the technical glitches we are going to be dealing with. But all in all, uh, Brian, I'm completely amazed at, at what we're seeing. Well, this was our future king of the side-by-side. -side, uh, <laughs> yes. The utility class <laughs> the, yeah, the utility, the utility class has stepped up the game quite a bit. Um, we're we're working on the on a different route there, but back to the back to the riders at hand. They are doing a great job. I'm going to be cutting out here in a little bit. I'm going to pass it over to for, for to Chris Johnson, the other Johnson, and you guys are going to be taking it from here. I got uh, I have the pleasure of going down and, and and sitting with my teammate and collect the trophy truck legend uh, championship trophy. So I'll be back first thing in the morning. We'll be going. We'll be up rise and shine. But right now. Um, Everything is perfect. We'll see what the weather what the weather what the weather holds for us tomorrow. We know it's going to be cold in the morning because holy moly, <laughs> it was chilly this morning. It's probably going to be chilly for those guys tomorrow morning, so they're going to start in their jackets. But again, they have six hours for race two tomorrow to complete that. So just think about that. You're going to start in your jacket with your winter gloves on, and by the time you're on lap two, you're going to be stripping down to your vintage jersey. And look at the wall that Tristan Hart is currently having to just goat trail his way up right now what a great job just keeping momentum as he works his way up you can see how loose and silty that trail is when you can see he comes up looks left right in oh. there oh we got it looks, looks like, like Ryder Hager. LeBlond or Colton Haker it's definitely a rock star husky it looks like Colton Haker and then Cody Webb if I can hit that right there's Colton Cody number two yep or no I'm sorry yep so we got Cody and Cooper right so and Cody. And Colton. yeah then you got all right, first, up on the top, we're pointing at the screen, which you can't see. Sorry about that, folks. The top rider in the black gear and the white bike is Colton Haker. Second is Cooper Abbott, correct? Correct. With the white helmet. And then comes Cody Webb on the, on the, on the, with the yellow Red Bull helmet as he goes by Cooper Abbott, and he finds a whole new route around. And this is where those long legs really pay dividends. He is the goat of hard enduro. So in the United States, he's definitely considered the goatee. <laughs> of hard enduro here and you're seeing why he realized colton is stuck i don't want to stay behind him and stay bottlenecked i want to get caught back up to tristan so he would go to the right so Ryder leblond we just got word is actually in the lead right now so we were seeing colton haker here on that rock star uh, rock star husqvarna but right now we're watching cody webb work his way so he has to go get caught up to tristan hart who is in second place and then it sounds like Ryder leblond is in first place right now. That is awesome to see for such a phenomenal young man that's been out here competing in hard enduro since he was about 12 years old. Well, and for for Cody, I mean, it really says a lot. The <clears throat> you know the how how tough he is with that with that wrist injury as we watch and the riders start to work their way down the hills again. This makes me want to ride. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to pass my mic over to Chris Johnson. I'm going to let you guys take it from here. I know, I know I'm leaving you all in good hands, but thank you so much. I will see you again. And we, if you're just tuning in, you are watching the SRT Off-Road King of the Motos 2023 in Johnson Valley. No relation to myself or Chris, but I'm going to pass over the mic to Chris Johnson. Enjoy the rest of the show, people. Hey, man, great job on your win this year. Go get that championship and look good in that tuxedo for us, all right? We've got Chris Johnson coming in here, but as we were talking about, SRT is the is the top king of the moto sponsor, and then we have Progressive Insurance, Optima Batteries, Can-Am, Ford, Bronco, Monster Energy, and Naito Batteries. So just so many great supporters as that supporting these riders hanging out here trying to see if they can create and find momentum out there in these shaley rocks of the Johnson Valley OHV Park. 
Now, you've been out here for a long time, right? You've been coming to this property for many, many years, haven't you, Chris? My very first Desert Race, 1974. <laughs> it's kind of dating myself a little Did bit. Did you think but that back then we would be coming here and trying to ride through the rocks versus uh, over the rocks? Well, back in the day, the early Desert Race, and we're going to get a chance to talk to Mikey Childress here pretty soon. Mikey's one of my longtime Desert Racing heroes, of course, many-time district champion and Baja champion as well. In fact, uh, Mikey, come on up, brother. Mikey can come and join us here in just a moment. But uh, back in the day, it used to be wide open across the desert. Well, as we started transpiring into more suspension, uh, more technology coming into the motorcycles, uh, more technical difficulties had to be put in front of these riders to slow them down a little bit. Because I tell you what, the high speed coming into all this was definitely pretty gnarly. And uh, talking about desert racers, Here's a many-time District 37 and Baja champion, Mikey Childress. Mikey, always great seeing you, brother. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Good to see you, man. Hey, so you've been to quite a few of these hammers as a spectator. Yep. Never participated as a, as a competitor, have you? Not on a motorcycle. I did uh, my first King of the Hammers last year in a 4800 truck, and uh, it's, it's the same stuff as these guys are going through, just a tiny bit wider, and uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's my whole entire motorcycle career, I was taught to stay away from that stuff. And then they just throw you right into it. It's pretty wild. And now you have another generation of youngsters coming up. But uh, what were you telling me about? You're not going to let your kid race on a motorcycle? No, he's, he's asked me to, to get a motorcycle. And, and we keep being hesitant and not letting him to do it. You know, I've, I've always said with motorcycles, it's not if, it's when and how bad you're going to get hurt. And... Uh, not ready to see him get hurt yet. Well, tell us what you've won in your career. Oh, I've been I've been really fortunate. I've won uh, over 150 District 37 races. Um, I've won Baja two times overall on a motorcycle. Um, I've won my class like three other times at the Baja, uh, Baja 1000. I have the uh, world record at Pikes Peak in a pro truck. Mm -hmm. um, done done some cool stuff. So. Um, racing's been really good to me and very fortunate. You know, and for people that don't know, Mike, Mike was in the transition between the X, XR650s back in the day when it changed to the 450s, which are so popular now with the Hondas. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I always joke around and say, in, in my era, we were on true open bikes. You know, we were on 650s. We were doing 110 to 116 miles an hour, and I always joke around now that, you know, they're barely going 105. So, but you um, take a look at the desert stuff now compared. I mean, it seems like the clubs are putting more and more obstacles, more and more gnarly stuff, starting to come a little bit closer to hard enduro. Not quite, but back in the day when you started, it was pretty much wide open. Yeah, and, you know, we had, we had certain clubs with District 37, you know, the Checkers and the Hunters MC would put on some difficult national hare and hounds. And we would get into some tight stuff like this for, you know, a mile or two, but not an entire race of it you know we, we, we would have a, a little section here but we'd still have a 10 mile fast pace across a valley into another little half mile tight section and you know maybe maybe out of a hundred mile race there was 10 miles of tight well it's a lot different now it's probably a little closer to 15 or 20 miles of tight but uh anyway your call who do you think is going to be our top honor here for the king of motos you know i'm i'm really rooting for uh for Abbott, you know, I've watched the kid grow up, um, been fortunate enough to race with his dad and team up with Destry and, and uh, Young Guns. I want to see the Young Guns do good. I also want to see Webb do good, but uh, coming back from an injury. So, you know, I know that's always hard for him, but uh, I want to see the kids win. It's always good. I'm a Coop, a Coop fan as well. In fact, uh, I, I announced the Juab Extreme in Utah, and it's an enduro cross, and it's not too difficult. But we have a $15,000 pro purse for it, and Cooper took the top honors this last year. Oh, man, that's awesome. So. These kids these days are amazing. It's, it's amazing to see what these kids are doing on, on motorcycles and, and my kid on, in a race car. It's, it's amazing watching how quickly these kids adapt and overcome and, and how talented they are. Now, taking a look at the desert scene right now for the off-road, for, for example, the National Hare and Hounds, two-time National Hare and Hound champion, uh, you know, you take a look at what, what this lad's done on, on the Husky the last couple of years. Yeah. Can, can he be touched? 
you know, there's 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 always somebody better than you. There's always yeah. going to be something. You you oh. have your your season or two of of being untouchable, and then someone catches on and figures it out, and and they'll be on top of you. You know, I know I, Dalton Cherie definitely has it right now. Though. Yeah, for sure, for sure. He's oh, yeah. he's definitely in what they would call the untouchables, but. Um, there's always somebody coming. You always got to be looking over your shoulder. So in your career, what was your absolute favorite win that you ever had? Um, favorite win for me is uh, I think it's got to be the 2007 Baja 1000. It was the uh, first time that Honda won the Baja 1000 on a CRF 450X. Um, I got to team up with Steve Hingeville and Quinn Cody. And we won the overall by over two hours. We had a flawless wow. race. Um, it was 18 hours and 57 minutes from Ensenada down to La Paz. And uh, it was just one of those dream races. No problems, no flats, no crashes. Everybody did everything they want. The pits were there. The helicopters were fine. And uh, everything went, went as planned. And when it does like that, you honestly don't have any cool stories to talk about. So you said it was 18 hours? 18 hours. Well, and don't they time out at 30? What's uh, the I don't out? I remember what the time was. I wanted to say it was 48 hours, your, your time limit was that year, going all the way to La Paz. Um, but we did it in 18 hours, and, and it was two hours till Johnny Campbell came in. Um, they had a pretty bit ferocious day with a couple of big wrecks, and I believe that year uh, Kendall Norman broke his wrist, and Robbie Bell had a concussion, and Johnny was having back problems, so they, they had a horrible race, but they still finished second, and it was uh, one of those years that I always remember. And their mutual teammates on top of that. Yeah. Yeah, on top of that. That was pretty cool. Well, always always great seeing you, Mikey, and, you know, uh, your, 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 career, your career's huge, and, you know, the record is hard to beat. District 37 champion, and, of course, you're a, you're a checker, right? If I remember I, correctly. I was a checker. Um, you was or are? I was. I'm, huh. I'm in the checker car club now. Okay. Um, motorcycle club. Um, I, for one, was was more interested in racing, and, and uh, the checkers wanted me to hang out and party with them all night. So I didn't get kicked out of the club, but. I could tell you some pretty wild checker stories. There, There's some good but checker stories. I, I, I'm not a checker. I'm, I was a pack rat back in the 70s, and I'm, I'm the current rover. So, uh. We would look at the checkers, and you know, a lot of them are good friends. But in fact, uh, Chris Anderson's a good friend of mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's in fact he he does. I, I trained him in doing environmental studies back in the day. He actually worked for me for a while. Chris Anderson and I did some amateur racing back when I was young, like 12, 13 years old, and uh, we won an amateur championship together. So that's cool. His awesome. brother, his brother actually did enduros and did really well with enduros. He's one of the first uh, TM sponsored riders when TM come over from Italy, so uh, it was pretty cool. A lot of a lot of racing history. His dad, was, of course, is a long-standing Baja racer as well. Yep. yep. So we're we're watching right now, and it uh, looks like they're starting to open up a little bit on some of this terrain. Not so much on the on the up and the downhills, and we are still viewing. And yep. uh, this would be more stuff that that Mikey would like. That's for sure. Instead of the gnarly rocks that we were seeing earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, I was always I was always the taller, bigger, heftier guy, and uh, the the guys would always like you know they would take off from me in the rocks. But I knew as soon as we got to the valley floor that we would gobble them up. But the rock sections are really fun. You know, this is where you could really see the talent in these guys, and you know the guys with with the trials background. It's funny we were talking earlier about how they they use the rocks for traction, and Cody Webb you know uses that. And where there's some riders that try to go around it, he goes up and over it. And uh, it is it is truly amazing to see what these guys can do on motorcycles and the things they go over and up and down. And they do it, and they make it look so easy, and it's not. Now, it, it, when you were racing bikes, uh, were the moose starting to come into popularity? Yeah, we, we, ran, we ran mooses in the front all the time. Um, that was right at the beginning of the mooses, and we would run them in the rear tires. The rear tires would get so hot that the moose would come apart and end up slapping you in the back and ripping your chest protector and your jersey off. So we, we chose not to run them in the rear too much, but we, we did run them in the front. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. You know, it's really important to grease the inside of the tire and to grease the rim and to have a good band on your rim as well because any sort of friction that's caused on a moose will cause a hot spot 
and tear the moose apart. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for for those of you that that don't know, a lot of these guys, um, well, I, I guarantee most all of these guys, they're running a foam insert inside of their tires that prevents them from getting a flat. And by doing that, you know, it uh, save you a lot of time, and it gives you a a, a more feel with the motorcycle uh, like you're running a lower tire pressure and you can get better traction and obviously number one thing is you don't want to be stuck out there with a flat tire so the moose is is i guarantee 90 percent of them have a moose well and, and having a moose insert also with the option of running air a lot of these guys are running like five pounds you'd run what 12 or 14 in the front and 12 in the rear in, in Baja, in the 650s, they were so heavy that we would have to run 16 to 18 pounds just so we didn't pinch the tubes. Um, but uh, with the, the one downside about running the moose insert in the front was at the speeds we were going, we would destroy wheels. You know, the, the moose isn't as strong as, as a highly air tire that's aired up to 20 or 22 pounds. So the moose gives a dead feeling. And when you hit a big rock at speed with a moose, and when I say at speed, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour, it will dent and destroy a wheel. And sometimes the moose actually will fall out of out of the tire. Well, I like that you were starting to break down like what a moose is because we have been talking about a moose, but in the long run, a lot of people may not know by the name. And what's even more interesting, you mentioned when they started to come out. Now we're seeing all kinds of different brands. I believe it was Michelin and Dunlop. They had mooses. And after that, you know, but now we're starting to see many more companies come to market especially in the hard enduro side because they saw so many people drilling them out trying to perfect their feel yep that it's it's insane to see the growth there in the uh the foam insert market yeah um i i believe nitro is kind of the uh the moose leader now um i i personally haven't ran one but um i've heard nothing but good good results about them and you know just like like NASCAR or anybody, you know, a half a half pound of air pressure, a pound of air pressure matters. So, the feel on your moose is is the same thing as like what a NASCAR driver or somebody would you would equivalent that to. Yeah, it's it's grown so much that there are now. I, I was just scrolling through Instagram and checking things out, and there is a company now that's starting to make. I think they're seven millimeter thick tubes. Right to try to get a crazy heavy-duty tube, but the, the rim locks are actually built into the tube. I've so heard now about that. they're trying to get to this point where they're kind of removing the rim locks, removing the foam insert because again, now you're drilling it out. It's going to disintegrate. If you can get air back in there, you have more control, and that's where the tubeless system. Though it's not tubeless, the tubeless system also kind of comes in to the middle. Was that a system that you potentially ever used? That tubeless system. Uh, no, we, we were strictly mooses, but you know, the, the issue that we struggled with was when we were racing Baja motorcycles, there was no speed limits on the pavement. So we would actually sometimes hop on the pavement cause we knew who we had a 60 or 80 miles pavement section and we would opt to stop and put a street tire on to race the 80 mile section on the pavement. Cause you're doing a hundred, 110 miles an hour for 50, 60, 80 miles, where if you put a dirt tire on you could totally disintegrate a dirt tire in less than five miles on a 650 on the pavement. So the, uh, the time that it took to stop and put on a street tire and then race 80 miles and stop and put a back, put, go back to a dirt tire was much quicker than, than using a dirt tire and nursing it and trying to save it back till you get to the dirt. And so. that's interesting because that's in, in that form of desert racing, y'all are, you have a pit crew, right? You're allowed to have people that are helping you work on the motorcycle. Where What we're watching here on screen for the king of the motos, it is rider help rider, right? Yeah. Even when tomorrow they're going to have two laps for race number two, they are not allowed to have outside support so they can go set up a kind of a pit area, a gas stop where they might have parts, gas, uh, liquids, right? Anything they want to rehydrate, refuel with, but they cannot get outside help. If, unless it is a racer. So, like, right. how do you think that would have changed everything you did if it was only you out there on the bike and no one else but another racer could help you? You know, for, for us in Baja, you know, there, there would be times where our pits are 55, 60 miles apart. So in that little area, it was still very similar to this. There was nobody out there. So it was, it was Something you. Something happened. It was you, you and what you out. had in your fanny pack, yeah. you know, so – um, you had to be. What's you the had biggest really life-saving thing that you had in there that you were like, "Thank goodness that we put that in there." 
zip ties. Zip ties. <laughs> Got it. Duct tape <laughs> and a lighter. Yep. The, honestly, the most important things to have because yeah. you can probably mm -hmm. just about get anything compact enough with zip ties or duct tape, and then you can also start a fire with a lighter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you got really mad, you just burn your motorcycle. Yeah, and just walk away. <laughs> just walk away. Well, we'll see if we can get some updates from everybody that is out on the course to see who is in the lead. We're, earlier, we did hear that it was Ryder LeBlanc, Tristan Hart, Cody Webb. We did see Cody Webb passing there. Colton Hager and Cooper Abbott earlier on. So we'll have to see if we can get caught up there on how that's going to play out for everybody. As we are here at 2023, King of the Motos. Well, Mr. Chris Johnson, we're back here from our little bit of a commercial there at the 2023 King of the Motos. What are you thinking so far? We know that we've got a 12-mile loop, and right now we are about 40 minutes in. Right? We have not heard if anybody is close to the finish line yet. We are working on trying to figure out where our miles are at, but it, we did just hear Tristan Hart is in the lead. So it looks like, yep, Tristan Hart is our leader, followed by Will Reardon. And then there is a group. Yeah, it's kind of like the Colton Hakers, the Cody Webbs in there. We don't have the exact placement of where they're yep. at, but there. It looks like Will is in second. Trying to catch up, man. He did really good in that prologue, so it's great to see him carrying that momentum through into race number one. Just a little bit of record. I'd like to, like to thank Ma Mikey Childress for coming up and joining us in the booth. And Mikey, many time District 37 and Baja champion. And just a great, a great dude all together. So good. Thanks, thanks again, Mikey, for coming up and joining us. I love watching these riders just kind of work their way up because the biggest thing is even though they are kind of dragging their feet and pitter-pattering a little bit, they're really trying to keep that weight back on the bike so that they can keep that weight pushing that rear wheel into the ground. And then as we were talking about with Cody Webb, that clutch and throttle control that has to happen. So it's all about keeping the weight on the rear tire so it can find traction and then controlling that traction with your clutch and your throttle. It's, uh, it's an art form in and of itself. Well, think about that. Our top four riders right now are all over six feet tall. They are tall riders. Yep. Tristan Hart, I think, is six or six one. And Will Reardon, I think, is 6'1 or 6'2. And Coop Rabbit is 6'1, I believe. And, of course, Cody Webb, he's, what, 6'4? Yeah, he's definitely taller yeah. than I am. <laughs> he's a tall young man. Another, another tall rider we'd like to mention also is uh, Corey Graffender. You know, Corey, he's 6'4 he's as well. One of the longest standing, running, and current uh, competitors in the AMA Enduro Cross. And he is a employee of SRT, R title of presenting sponsor for 2023 King of Motos. Yeah, Corey Grafunder is awesome. Back in the day when I started the Seat Time podcast, he was one of my early, one of the early guests to come on. So super supportive of, of everything that we try to do with Seat Time. And it's great to see him back out here at the SRT King of the Motos.
It, uh, Will Reardon, uh, three. Coop is fourth. Colton Haker is fifth. And, of course, uh, it's Tristan Hart and Cody Webb. All right. Well, look at the Thank bottleneck. You. No, not the bottleneck, but look at the line of riders that we have here. So this is the tough part. When there's one line like this and you're one of the A, B, or C riders, it's very intimidating to go off of the main line. So you kind of do get a little bit into this single track goat trail uphill climb that has to happen. But that's part of it. Again, this in hard enduro is a great time to take a sip of water from your camelback, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth, get your heart rate down a little bit. Let's see these guys have to crawl their way up this little bit of a trail, kind of have this nice left-hand pivot at the top, and then they get to get up and over this rock and on to the next one. And talking about Corey Graffender, our SRT rider, uh, he finished out 14th for the prologue. Uh, Will Reardon, Cody Webb, and Tristan Hart were the top three in our first uh, qualifying round. But it's going to get interesting right now. we got five riders all within striking distance of each other. Yeah, it looks like we've got Tristan Hart on screen right now, and you can see him diligently looking at that GPS to see which direction he needed to go when he got kind of off of that downhill that he was riding down. Tristan Hart, of course, our 2021 King of the Motos champion. And uh, one time, and then Colton Haker, he is, he's won it twice. And, of course, uh, Cody Webb has won it five times shooting for that fifth. I mean, shooting for the sixth. Yeah, Cody Webb having that wrist injury, unfortunately, at the 2021 Tennessee knockout. I was part of the Cody Webb class that we were having. So I was there, and one of the riders that ran up to him to get his bike off of him when he injured his wrist and he has had multiple surgeries and a long injury from that so it's great to see him taking part in the super enduro series that's been going on in europe or you know between 2022 and 2023 there's still a couple more races for them his wrist is not 100 percent. we were talking to him about that but he says once it kind of gets warmed up he's feeling about 90 percent 85 percent so it's good to see he's out here he's still competitive again this is just going to be timing for how the setup goes down tomorrow. So him in the top five right now, even if that's where he finishes in about an hour or whenever they finish with the 12 miles, is not the worst place for him to be in race one. And you know, Brian, we've been talking about this. Each and every stage becomes more and more difficult. And uh, this is definitely more difficult than our prologue. And coming into our next race, race number two for tomorrow morning, it's going to become even more difficult. The final race is going to end up being, what I believe, 13 miles. 13 and a half miles. Yeah, so there's two different loops, one, and the first one is around 12 miles, and the second loop is going to be around 13.5. Look, at sometimes that's just what it takes. You just got to toss the bike. Pray that you don't uh, trash a throttle body or a radiator or plug up a side case, but sometimes you just got to get the motorcycle up the hill. But tomorrow what we do know is that it could take upwards of three hours to complete one of those loops. And, again, they only have six hours to do that. So if they do three hours on the first loop knowing – the second loop is longer and harder with more GPS involved. They're going to really have to move to finish within that six-hour time window. And try to preserve their energy in regards to that. Holy moly. You start what energy. Up, <laughs> yeah, what energy. After, after today, they're going to be sleeping hard tonight. They're probably going to be missing Supercross tonight, by the way. Oh, man. Oh, speaking of Supercross, I'd like to invite everybody here at Hammertown. We're going to have the big screen playing up for AMA Supercross tonight. That's going to be fun to watch. Anybody here, we'll get, see if we can get somebody to light us a nice big fire there. Why don't you start collecting some wood? You look like you need something to do. And uh, we'll have a lot of fun tonight if that's how we can make it happen down here watching Supercross on the big screen. Who's your favorite for tonight? Man, I've just been enjoying watching the racing. You know, I, it sucked that we had uh, Oakland that had to get canceled, right, with everything. And round two became round three or round three but didn't become round two, whatever the math worked out. It's been amazing to watch Eli Tomac just come out of the gate swinging. We have not seen that before, and now we're seeing the same thing from Jet Lawrence. So those two guys are just on a tear. And But the, even though the tracks have looked, again, air quotes, easy, I'm not a Supercross racer, and I know that I would not be out there by any means, even if you paid me a lot of money, um, I still think that we've gotten good racing out of the tracks. And it is a shame that Malcolm Stewart has looked great in um, running up to each of the mains so far and just really hasn't um, I could come to that. I think that win is coming, and I'd love to see that from Malcolm Stewart. But I've just, truthfully, the Supercross racing has been great so far for this year. Now, Malcolm, now Mookie has been carrying his, his speed 
farther and farther into the main event, yeah. getting closer and closer toward that end. He is probably the most explosive rider out there. But I'd say the most consistent, except for having poor starts the first two rounds, is Cooper Webb. I like this. We got a rider here just taking a break. I mean, maybe it's a it's a it's a staff rider. You know, we might have a sweep rider out there, but in the long run, sometimes you just got to take a break, check out your GPS. We have seen a couple times while we were talking with Mikey, different riders having to turn around. And again, this is a GPS race in the long run. There are markings on the course at some of the bigger potential misdirections. But what's going to happen is like they're going to have to come down a hill climb. They have to look at their GPS and figure out, do I need to go left? Do I need to take a straight across the desert? Or maybe even potentially take a right and go back up another nasty hill. You know, Justin Lineweber and his entire crew did a fantastic job of lining out these courses this weekend. And, uh, of course, making them more and more difficult as you come to the final round uh, tomorrow afternoon. But uh, taking a look at this right now, look at these two riders. They're going at it on yeah. the desert stuff. You know, this is the kind of stuff that Childress used to race, of course. A little more wide open. And that looks like well, Max Gersten, our media specialist. So uh, starting last year, Max Gersten has uh, started coming out to the U.S. Hard Enduro Series and following a lot of the pro riders to try to get that footage, you know, that, that right mm -hmm. behind the footer, uh, sorry, right behind the rider footage. Um, and if you go to the U.S. Hard Enduro YouTube channel to watch the recaps from last year, they have a lot of that footage, and it's super cool that he's out there doing that. Is that Tristan? That looks like Will Reardon. So Tristan's got those white backgrounds with that red number yeah, one. Yeah, you're right. That, that so does look like it looks like, like that uh, might be Will. the one for a while. We couldn't figure out, but we think it was 39. So Now, Will, of course, is originally from Australia. He's making his home down in South Carolina. His, his dad is, uh, owns an, an olive oil company. So, yeah. Uh, Actually, this is the finish right here. So these three riders are coming into the finish. We will get someone to come down there and let us know exactly who's coming in. Through Hopefully the finish. this is us watching first, second, and third come in. And there is definitely a happy racer there in the front, putting his hands up, getting all excited to have one race number one. It does appear to be Will Reardon taking the top honors here. He took top honors in the prologue as that well. That would be awesome for him to yes. get to win the prologue and then win race number one to have that confidence going into race number two tomorrow. He's one of those very soft-spoken racers that doesn't brag about nothing, and he's showing his colors. There's the checkpoint right there coming in. I love in. that. Yep. Checking on in and seeing which way do I have to go wow, next. Wow, such great drone coverage here as well. We have 12 drones flying around. Of course, they have to bring them down to, to exchange batteries and recharge them, and they have different locations all over the course. But uh, great coverage here this weekend for the King of the Motos. We did a little bit of tire talk earlier, and it's interesting because um, we heard Cody Webb talk about wanting a 140 millimeter tire. So when we say 140, that's width, right? So Correct. the reason they're wanting to have that wider tire is that it has a chance to grab around obstacles a little bit more. Now, there's going to be times where that actually is detrimental because sometimes you have a nar narrower trail that you're going to be on and it's going to be not as great to have a 140 again a wider rear tire and it's such an interesting debate between a 120 and a 140 but so many riders some riders like to have more knobbies some riders don't and so that's why all of these racers can find different tires from the tire manufacturers they either choose to purchase from or of course that they're sponsored by but what you see out here for these hard enduro racers the majority of them are going to be on what is called a air quotes gummy tire so these tires have a very, very, very sticky compound. So you could go up to this tire and it's extremely pliable. You can grab the knobs and you can almost twist them 180 degrees because those tires are made to grab the obstacles. And as we were talking about with the different foam inserts or if they're running tubeless, which is a system that has a tube that holds the bead on, the bead of the tire onto the rim, but then you can air up the carcass of the tire without having to be able to get pinch flats. All of that allows them, with the different tire of choice, the compound that they want to use, oh, look at this, that they can get the talking feel that they're looking bottleneck. for. Are you ready? Do you want to get on a bike? Let's get out there. Come on. Well, just what you're talking about with the tire compounds, a lot of these tires for, oh, look at that. That's a conga line if I've ever seen it. Right? You know? These guys are just dancing out there. And this is what we're talking about with the bottlenecks. No one wants to have to get stuck here because look what's happened. You can see that these rocks are covered in dust, right? That silty sand has worked its way all over those rocks. 
So there is very, very little traction there for them to work with. And then, of course, there are riders in the way also, so it's very hard for them to get up that rock face. And that is actually the rock face where we saw Cody Webb make the pass on Colton Haker and Cooper Abbott. You know, these tires that most of these riders are running are very soft compound. They're very, they're not very durable in rocks, but they're made to grab the rocks and grab a hold of it and gain good traction. You take a look at Tony Bio, you know, world, in, uh, world trials champion and some of the stuff that he does. Clear vertical straight up and down, and he grabs. How does he grab traction on a straight uh, one, totally vertical up and down. I don't know. One, magic. <laughs> yeah. And two, that is what, when, when all hard enduro racers say, I practice on a trials bike, that's why. All of the skills that you can pick up, the balance that you learn on a trials bike, and then, of course, that clutch throttle control, learning how to rev up the engine and then release that clutch to create that torque and that traction that you're looking for, that translates very well to hard enduro. But for him... Dude, he's just been doing this his whole life, and he has full commitment. So it's just no, insane just like, to watch that guy on just the Just like on the Graham Instagram. Jarvis. Those guys are not um, human. They're not awesome. human. They're from Mars. So I got to do a Graham Jarvis clinic uh -huh. uh, um, a couple months ago, and it's on. If you wanted to go to the Seat Time YouTube channel, you could go watch the video. I made a recap video of me doing the Graham Jarvis clinic, and it is so apparent how poor of a rider I am compared to a rider like Graham Jarvis. But he started as a trials rider, right? Mm -hmm. And when hard enduro really started early years with uh, the Erzberg Rodeo over in Austria, that was an event that appealed to him. He's like, oh, I could use my trial skills. Got out there, won the dang thing, and that just, you know, kind of snowballed a career for him. Same thing with Tadu Blazuziak. Trials mm -hmm. rider, Erzberg Rodeo, get a win, and all of a sudden you're enduro a big bike racer. Too. And, of course, uh, our, our very first uh, very first champion for King of the Motors was Graham Jarvis. Yeah, 2012. Very first Man, yeah. 11 years ago. How cool is that? There have been two misses, but this race has been going on for 11 years. Now coming up into one of these fast valleys. Great coverage here. These, these, these drone operators are on the mark. like to mention, of course, our fine sponsors of our 2023 King of the Motos. Nito Moose, Monster Energy, Bronco, Ford, Can-Am, Optima Batteries, Progressive Insurance, and SRT Off-Road. Of course, I'd like to mention just a little courtesy shout-out to all these fine sponsors as well. Dang Brothers Pizza, Jeepers Jamboree, KOH Instacart and Showers by Finish Line. Miles Mountain Firewood, PCI Race Radios, Potato Hut, Rocky Mountain ATVMC, The Donut Cafe, Triple S Concessions, VP Racing Fuel, Bees Fresh Squeeze Lemonade, and any others that are here with us for King of the Motos. Yeah, it's... Being a guy who grew up in southern Louisiana and then moved to Texas, right, northern Texas, coming out here and seeing Johnson Valley, like the Johnson Valley, right, of all the things that we've seen across the years in the history that's out here, it is so vast. It's so amazing. It's so beautiful. And to think that back in the day, we didn't utilize all the rocks that we do now for these hard enduro races and that you guys were just cruising as fast as possible through the open spots and nowadays it's slowing it down but there's probably some balance within that of the bikes getting so fast and riders and racers realizing that i love riding my dirt bike but 90 miles an hour plus is in my cup of tea and so the way that my friends and i think about it my buddy cody russell he always referred to it as it's kind of like going and finding a good skate spot so we when we want to go practice hard enduro stuff what we do is we just five, six of us, head out and about to whatever trails that we're at. We find a little section that's super gnarly, and we play. You know, and it's like going back in the day when you would have your BMX bike or your skateboard, mm -hmm. and you go find a place, and you might spend three hours there you just hanging work out, it and, work and you're it. just goofing off. Yep. Yeah, you're like, can I ride it like this? Can I ride it like that? And then you turn around and go 180 degrees the other direction. You might have been going down the creek, turn around, now you're going up the creek, right? And it's, 
a different type of enjoyment. And so I think that that's a little bit of why we're seeing kind of this growth of hard enduro is that there is a safety factor to it because the speeds are typically a lot less and it's so much more technically focused that it allows older riders, I'll admit it, like myself, to be kind of like be in the game a little bit longer, which I thoroughly enjoy and I've been having a ton of fun with all the riding buddies back in Texas now that I've kind of like got back into hanging out with them a little bit more. Well, like when I first started racing in the, out in the desert back in the 70s and ended up concentrating on motocross and Grand Prix, but uh, I remain in a desert club. One of the fun things I enjoy doing is laying out a desert course with my constituents. We'll get 12 to 15 club members and we'll make a big party weekend out of it just laying out a course. But uh, look at this gnarly stuff on the screen right now. I love it. And that's where we're starting to see the silt and everything. You know, as they drag that rear brake down that hill, you're starting to see all that dirt come over all those rocks. So it's just a little bit more technical, a little bit more slick for each rider that comes after. Now, here's another issue, too. As these riders in the backfield are, are trying to follow their GPS, it's becoming more and more easier because the course has been burned in now by the lead riders. Yeah. So probably for the B and the C riders, you could trust w the course that you see in front of you, right? It, the, the, the tracks that you see in front of you. But it's when you're in that top 10 where you have to be careful. And that's like what we just saw at Dakar so many times. Mm -hmm. These riders are out there and they're sort of kind of in the lead. They think they're following a track. But what they don't realize is that 30 minutes in front of them, the track that they're following, somebody was completely off basis. And so now everybody's turning around. I really enjoyed that one stage that was rained out for the motorcycles there for the Dakar Saudi Arabia to where the motorcycles weren't there. But in regards to that, the cars went out there and they're so used to following the bike's tracks after being GPSed, they got lost. There were six or seven of them spinning in circles. You probably saw that too. Destry Abbott with us in the booth. Good, good afternoon, Destry. Yeah, How are you, brother? Good afternoon. It was awesome. I was actually out there chasing the top few and uh work with quite a few of them and of course my son cooper pulled off a fourth but now i got a lot of these buddies and uh i wanted to come and watch the video feed that you guys are doing and talking and uh yeah support these guys this is an awesome event you know it, i think we had 170 entries and that's uh pretty dang cool with uh this event you know with so many different type of racing so it's awesome yeah two years ago we had 120 and we had right at 180 this weekend wow 180 that's cool yep. and uh yeah, I haven't been able to see any of the footage. It's the first time I've got to see any of the footage, and wow, this is pretty darn awesome. And, you know, today with it being qualifying, really is for gate pick tomorrow. The top 30 start on the front row. The next 30, de depends on what class you are. It doesn't depend, I should say. So overall, a nice, nice little wheelie there to pivot the bike. Like, it's a great job there. Instead of trying to lift, you want to use the power of the motorcycle and use that less energy. Uh, being efficient with hard enduro is so key in breathing and uh I love riding it. I don't care to race it as much anymore. I just, uh, I love supporting it. I love coming out here riding with these guys and training with them. But uh, no, this is fun. Like, that's a great pivot right there. He's not using a lot of energy, and uh, it's fun to watch. And also, at the same time, giving the bike a little bit of time to cool down just a little bit. Uh, every time you fall down, you have to pick the bike up. It, it, it exerts so much energy just to pick the bike up more so than riding a couple miles. Oh, 100%. And as you start seeing the, the slower the guys are, I don't want to say slow because they're amazing riders, all these people out here, men and women, and uh, they'll start teaming up with each other and helping each other out farther back. The top guys usually don't, but uh, I can see from second, Tristan put a, another clinic on again, but from second to, I think, fifth, those guys were all together and kind of keen off each other. I saw them, Coop would be in second and get lost, and they'd go back and uh, – now yeah, these guys are battling here, which is awesome to watch again. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll start helping each other, like I said. No help in here, though. These guys are going at it. Oh, these guys are racing. They're, they're racing for position. But, again, they're, they're using a lot of energy. Like the top, oh, there we go. A little carnage there. But uh, they're using a lot of energy. And I think today the top guys weren't pushing as hard to where they know tomorrow is what really matters. Today, as long as they're on the front row, the first top five, ten picks – that's the key going into tomorrow. Now, you, you've raced this event a couple of times, and uh, what's your best finish? Um, I've raced this twice, and I've gotten a third overall and a fourth overall. So first year was on a 450. I posted it on my social media Instagram, and uh, wasn't ideal. You know, that was the first year that uh, they put let him go, and then he can go. So, you know, it's it's just experience. And extreme racing is about experience. Like 
that's a good pan out, you know, panning out there. And you can see how when you're sitting there, that's when you take a drink, get your heart rate back down because it spikes. You'll be in zone five, meaning you're at your threshold and, you know, sitting down at times where you can and just work on relaxing your muscles and, and breathing is key because tomorrow is going to be four to six hours for a lot of these guys. You know, even though we're shooting for three hours for both rounds. Now, uh, Cooper's been doing really good in enduro cross, been steadily climbing up the ladder in the standings. And what did he end up finishing for last year? Um, he missed quite a few of the last ones going into enduro cross, and he leaves tomorrow, to, or I mean uh, Tuesday, to Hungary for the Super Enduro Series. So he's he's going back and forth. He got a second overall and a third overall at the U.S. Hard Enduro Series, a couple rounds, but then he missed the last couple focusing on enduro cross. Yeah, we've mentioned this a couple times. He was the champion this last year at, at the Juab Extreme, and uh, been coming out there for a couple rounds. And uh, you, of course, you and you and Cooper are also doing a riders clinic, and you've been doing quite a few riders clinics at these enduro crosses. Yeah, I do D8 Training dot com. I have websites and stuff, and I work with quite a few of these guys. So, you know what they're going through, I know all too well because I'm out there with them and uh, training with them and riding with them, and uh, we're pushing ourselves, learning when to push, when not to, when to be smart when to slow down, and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, like I said, it's experience. With off-road racing, it's uh, learning to read the terrain and just being smart through a lot of this stuff. Standing up, waiting the pegs, so you're basically using more of a kind of, uh, I guess, like a, a jockey on the horse, but the horse being the motorcycle. So being loose on the bike, efficient, and, uh, you know, like where this guy is, he's doing a great job standing up, getting those hips back, making sure you're not putting a lot of ar weight on the arms. And locking the knees, keeping good con contact with the bike as well. Yeah, now, yeah. Now, through your career, you started out just racing motocross and then went to went to desert racing and ended up locking down a, quite a few national hair and hound championships. And what made you decide to go to the go to the more extreme on the enduro side and the enduro cross? Because you you took top honors in the veterans class, if I remember right, for enduro cross. Yeah. No, I love I love just racing motorcycles, riding motorcycles even more now. But I, I just wanted to be real versatile. So I qualified for outdoor motocrosses, hard enduros, of course, Heron Hounds, ISDs. I did 10 of them. I have seven gold medals there. And I just loved riding motorcycles. A great job there, waiting that peg. And this is where that bottleneck is. You almost got to be patient here. And if you see the guy struggling in front of you, you actually kind of need to help him to team up and help yourself get going faster. Uh, but I think all these guys are just taking deep breaths and uh, just, uh, like I said, this is almost just a warm-up race going in tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be the big one, and they think this is tough. I, uh, I know what's out there tomorrow, and they're going to have a blast, but uh, they're going to get their money's worth. Well, well spent for sure. Well, Justin and his crew have learned from the very best, Jimmy Lewis. Look at this. Just throw it away. Yeah. And not I, the right side to throw it. You'd rather throw it on the clutch side, not the throttle yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that feeling all too well. And uh, what a cool shot, you know, with uh, the helicopter footage. Just the, the footage here. And the we don't get this that often. So we're, we're really uh, lucky. And uh, I don't know if that's – is that Morgan, Justin Morgan? It looks I like think, Justin. Yeah, yeah. He's. I think he's the only four-stroke out here, which is kind of uh, amazing to see two strokes – at, at the hard enduros is pretty much dominant now it's the four strokes so much heavier and they're great for moto great for gps and even gncc's and stuff like that but nowadays the two strokes just are so easy and smooth and you can lug the bike and especially it, pivoting and stuff like that and don't overheat like the four strokes no do. no they definitely don't overheat even the guys still will run fans on their motorcycles and oh there we go yep I've been there way too many times, so I don't, uh, I can't laugh at them because I, I know I'm that guy a lot of times too. They don't call it hard enduro for nothing, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, Je of course, uh, Justin, he's a, a, I believe, two time Baja 1000 champion. Teamed yeah, up Justin, with Kendall Justin's Norman. an amazing rider. Yeah, awesome dude too. So, in your illustrious career, what's your absolute favorite win? Oh, that's a that's a really good one. I don't uh, I don't even know if I could pick one because I have so many different terrains or type of races and stuff. And uh, I, I don't know. I just I, don't, I enjoyed the tight ones, the more technical, I guess. But uh, everybody knows me as a heron hound and a desert guy and going fast. But I actually like the slower speed ones because that's what separates riders more. Put in the work versus on a road or Baja. Nothing against Baja, but I just like the more technical stuff. Well, here we are coming up out of the valley, back up into the other mountains.
Well, Riley LeBlanc finishing up the top five. What what'd you say? Cooper was in second? Cooper was fourth. So, Cooper's yep. fourth. Yeah, so unofficial. it's unofficial. Yeah, and third um, was Cody Webb, Cooper's teammate. I know uh, Will passed uh, Cody right at the end, uh, Cooper was telling me. Just chatted with him for a few minutes. And, uh, you know, the, the guys were just kind of cheating off each other. Like I said, they know if they finish top five, that's going to be good enough for them. Of course, they still have – that racing edge and they want to pass someone at the end but uh yeah like these guys are still racing coming in right here and that's uh that's a cool thing adds to the bragging rights as well if you consider you know will reardon took the prologue and our first our first round today uh coming in with an advantage just on the mental aspect of it correct yeah and and, and that is a, you're exactly right the mental part is a huge part and you know proved to other guys and i know colton had some issues early Col colton haker and He'll be up there. I promise you that guy will be up front too. And Corey Grafunder, he's kind of getting older, but he's still really good and just keeps plugging away. And he'll uh, he'll use his experience. So there's there's quite a few stacked riders in this. I think Tristan, Cody Webb, Ryder LeBlanc with his factory deal at Husqvarna now. Those guys have stepped up, and uh, it's going to be some great battles out there tomorrow. You know, one of, my, one of our Arizona boys, Nick McGowan, he was uh, the top 40-plus expert in a – that class is starting to grow now. It's it's kind of nice to see. Yeah, Nick is a good buddy of mine. We ride together, and Dan Hikow. We got a lot of guys in Arizona cool that are too. hard enduro, and uh, it's it's cool to see it growing like it is. And you know, it's kind of weird being the first one last year or two years ago because we didn't have it last year, but uh, we were the last event to go off, and it was insane. You know, there's so many people, but I like it this way. It's you know a little safer for us, especially going across the valleys, and uh, especially on racing and stuff like that. So. That's a cool, that's a dang cool video right there, a photo, however you want to say it. That's uh, some great footage right there wow. to show you how high they are up, and they drop down, and next thing you know, you're going right back up again. And we're starting to assemble a pretty good crowd out here in front of us, and we'd like to invite everybody, of course, for tonight for AMA Supercross on the big screen. And uh, who's your favorite for tonight? Man, Eli's really tough. Like, uh, I, yeah, like I like Eli. I've known Eli from years ago, a long time ago. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's sure. cool to see how stacked that series is. And Cooper Webb's riding really well. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be neat to see that. I'm, I'm definitely going to be here watching on the big screen also. Well, you know, I've been I kind of labeled Cooper, even though he's the same, same name as your son. But uh, that one race, man, from 14th place to second, that's, that was phenomenal. That's impressive, especially yep. against the stacked field. That the, the 450 class is uh, – you know, it's Sexton's going to be good. I, I like Sexton's style. He's really efficient. He makes it look easy. You know, I think Chase is going to be there just like him and Eli last year with outdoors. It's going to be uh, coming down to the end. But Eli started off well, and he usually doesn't do that. So I think with his experience, and he seems like he's in a good mindset, he's riding well, he's having fun, he's smiling. And I'm like, that's what it's about. It seems like his family life is good. And when you get to that level, that's all a factor. And I think the biggest thing with, with – Looks Coop like he got a bro – looks like something broke there. Oh, man. Number 117, oh. yeah. Uh, that's the three brothers for KTM rider. Uh, he had problems coming off. He finished the prologue. 117. We got a nice little bottleneck. I don't know what the other guy's – he's off his bike. Oh, he's helping him. That's what he's doing. We talked about teaming up. I said the farther back, you'll see more and more teaming up. And now you kind of you kind of realize how good the top guys are because this is this is these are great riders back here. But when you see those top guys going through this and it, people go, oh, that doesn't look that bad. Well, trust me on video and stuff like that. It doesn't look as hard as it is. Then when you actually watch these guys who are B riders, A riders struggling and just uh, trying to get through. It looks like he's uh, working on the bike, seeing if he can make it uh, make it to the finish. Oh, it must be overheating. We were just talking about that. And yeah. uh, that's maybe Sean, he doesn't have a fan or it broke or something, too. That's Sean Kepler from Costa Mesa, by the way. Great drone drone coverage here. Yeah. Have you ever seen an event like this with such great drone no, coverage? No, this is, this is phenomenal footage. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I wish we had this at more races because uh, we got some exciting stuff that happens. And all we do is tell stories afterwards. And, you know, it's like people don't get to see what we do or what these guys are going through and what they're uh, racing on. And, the gnarly obstacles or the crashes or the passes. And, you know, that's what we talk about motocross, supercross is a blast to watch. But uh, the fact that we get to come here and 
I get to sit here in the studio and watch this racing is pretty darn awesome. There's Rodrigo Lopes that just chimed on through, number 75. Now, he's a, been a hard enduro specialist for the last couple of years, originally from Spain or Brazil. I think he's from Brazil. Yes, originally. Makes his, makes his home in, in Colorado now. But uh, he was talking about possibly doing the older guy class, but he decided to do pro. That was him just buzzing on by, number 75. Still, you know, we had 25 riders that did not finish in the prologue. Oh, wow. I didn't out know that. Out of 180. That. So, you know, it, even a prologue kind of bit into some of the riders. I'm curious. I think probably a few of them, quite a few of them, I would say, are uh, probably more mechanicals because this is really tough on bikes. If you fall over, you break a radiator, if you have an issue like that, you're, you're pretty much out. And uh, this is what I was saying early on. You just got to be smart, you know, when to push, when not to. If you're going through gnarly stuff. Trying to save the bike. Here we go. A little drop off. And, uh, you know, he's doing a good job waiting in the bags. But as you get more tired, it's uh, it's definitely not going to be as easy because uh, we all want to sit down. But you definitely don't want to sit down on this situation here. You know, we were talking about that earlier. The, the, a lot of the factory teams have two bikes for each rider. But you're only allowed to ride one bike. But you can switch all the parts from one bike to the other just to keep things rolling. And right. Is, is, that the case, is that the case with Cooper? Yeah, they all have spare bikes, spare race bikes here, and uh, a lot of it for parts if they need it. Oh, that's um, Cameron. Yeah, it is. Yeah, nice, Cameron. Cameron's a good buddy. Of course, he, I'm sure he's racing four wheels this weekend. Looks like we uh, got a little... Uh, if I remember right, I think Cameron's riding five different classes. Is Cameron racing five? I know a couple yeah. years ago he raced quite a few classes, and what a good guy. I've gone to his event down in Mexico, and... I love spending time with them and great family. And, you know, he's an enthusiast of the sport, just like a lot of these motorcycle guys are fans of the trucks, the cars, vice versa. I know a lot of them that uh, came out early to watch that are racing this weekend. And we love supporting each other. We're all off-road fans. We love being out here. And it's a great family sport. And I don't think a lot of people realize how family-oriented this is. Well, Cameron's kind of an okay announcer, too. Cameron's a really good guy. Yeah, he's, <laughs> I remember X Games. I've done, quite, I've done quite a few X Games, and he's, uh, he's great at announcing and definitely hyped me up, so i got to give him a plug there. Well, what, was the, what did you see different from when you were first out here in 2012 to now? And what would you, uh, how would you approach things differently? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I think 2012, I was still – I was actually – I turned 40 that year when I got on the podium. Uh, 50 now and uh i i don't think hard enduro here in the u.s was that big so right. uh i raced my 450 because i was dumb and i didn't know any better and i'm like oh i'll make up time in the valleys and i'm like yep yeah, graham jarvis won and he was on another level and he's just going straight over rocks and i'm trying to weave in and out and i think the level the bikes we didn't have gummy tires now these guys are all on two strokes where we talked about four strokes i was on a 450 and not ideal through these situations you talk about being tired and the next year, I dropped to a 250F. I was with Monster Energy Kawasaki. Oh, that's a cool shot. I really dig that shot right there. Um, it's it's kind of neat to see it develop and evolve to, uh, evolve to what it is today because in Europe, it's huge. And here in the States, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Enduro Cross, Extreme Racing, this series is growing. And uh, I know the next round is going to Hawaii and then third round to Page, Arizona. So uh, it's it's neat to see the level of the youth riders, the adults, the vets. There's 45 plus, 40 class is packed. So uh, I think as we get older, we don't want to go as fast. And, uh, you know, it's it's for sure getting tougher, but the, the pros are so darn good, they're making it look easy. And it, that's a good example of watching them come through these sections. You see the pros make it look easy where those guys are just trying to get through. And, you know, it's the, the levels just keeps going up and up. What is it that you work on your DA8 athletes specifically that differs for, say, someone who might be a works racer and might be, you know, out here today for the uh, king of the motos? That, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, like I told you, I, I wanted to be versatile. I wanted to ra race everything. And uh, it depends on whether level is. The pros, I don't have to teach how to ride the bike anymore. It's more about the mental side, breathing, hydrating, what to eat before the races, you know, and, and line choices, you know, looking up, really – taking your time and finding good lines where the newer riders I'm teaching them how to weight the pegs and stuff like that. And it's about smooth throttle, like short shifting, getting the weight to the rear tire, to the gummy tire where moto works, GPs and GPC, 
it's more about being aggressive sprint speed this isn't about sprinting like you can't sprint this right but your heart rate will be higher in this it's more interval training mm -hmm. where you're going to be at 190 195 200 if you're younger and then you're going to drop back down to 130 because now you're going across the valley and instead of trying to make up your time in that valley use that as a time to drink or you know make sure you have gels at the pits everybody talks about fueling the bike but you want to fuel the body just as much there's joe bridges he's a buddy of ours in uh, arizona and he works at the shop aeo power sports that i uh, i go to and stuff and putting in a solid ride he uh doesn't do get too too many races but it's cool to see him out here and it looks like he's getting ready to come into the finish nice yeah so this looks like just to the left of the uphill that that they went up earlier because they were exiting more off to that right side to head up earlier as they were heading out for the prologue but now these guys look like they're coming in for the end of race one together yeah i think he's looking down his gps and that's the tough thing that this this differs from all the other hard enduros we do here in the states uh it's the only one we use gps tracking and uh yeah he's stoked yeah that's he's so excited cool. to be here that's how he is he's a great guy and uh yeah i'm sure his wife and they're watching on tv and it's cool right on well Destry, obviously, very much appreciate you jumping hey, in here. Thank and, you for uh, sharing me. all the information for sure, man. Awesome. Well, looking forward to watching tomorrow. Right on, dude. We're going to throw to commercial really quick, and we will be back very shortly. synonymous with VWs. Known around the world for quality, speed, and innovation. Impy, the first VW speed equipment. Over 25 years of off-road racing dominance. Proprietary patented race technology. Proudly made in the USA. Unparalleled customer service and support. The choice of champions. King Shocks. The leader in off-road shock technology. I've been modified, 45, fitting like a Mordecai. I ain't regular, feel like Jordan wearing 45. Shining like a real anthem. Charlie saw my wallet, now she think a nigga handsome. Whoa, telling me she wanted me to hammer. Trying to get saved, baby, I am not the answer. No, I can never trick, trick, trick. Let's the bitch, my bitch, with a kiss on my lips, like, oh. I am not a pimp with a limp. I'm a man with a gift, and I'm doing my shit, like, oh. What you all about? What you dollar about? Welcome back to the SRT King of the Motos presented by RIC. Excited to realize that we've got quite a few racers in, but they have three hours to get to the finish line. So if you were to try to complete 12 miles within three hours, that would sound quite insane, wouldn't it? Well, especially when you have to go and pick your motorcycle up over a 50,000 rocks. 
Especially is, rocks as big as a Volkswagen. Yeah, you just look never at that know. shot right there. Speaking of rocks, right, he's just wow, looking at that vantage point going, what am I doing right now to myself? You know, here in Johnson Valley, there are so many beautiful views up on these bluffs. And uh, one, of my, one of my Rover club members just went out by, Mike Castro, and uh, he's seen some of the best. He's ridden here since he was a little kid, and he knows all these trails around here like the back of his hand. So uh, with a... And I'm sure he's been sitting up on a bluff. Look at the view I know, over right? all these mountains. I think it's interesting. One thing we haven't really talked about is look how much protective gear he's got on, right? So obviously we talked about a lot of rocks. There's a lot of tumbles that could happen. This rider is choosing to go the extremely protective route. So not only does he have shoulder pads, the chest protector, the back protector, but he's even got elbow guards on, of course, a full face helmet, which is just the right thing to do with the speeds that we do carry. You want to make sure you've got that face covered up. But then you see a lot of other riders, they're very limited with the protection that they choose to wear. That, that, that It's all about comfort level. But well, with these rocks, I would want some elbow pads. <laughs> we, we do have an, an additional class in, involved with our King of the Motos this year, and that is the youth class. And uh, 12 years and under are required to have chest and back protection as well as one of our new rules for King of the Motos. Yeah, that's a, a new 2023 AMA rule that just came out is that uh, all youth riders need to have uh, front and rear chest protection. And within chest protection, too, there are different levels. And so I, that's one of the things that we'd have to clear up on exactly what level of protection that also is going to integrate. Because if it's C1, that's uh, there's certain things that are going to come with that. Or if it's going to be C2, there is then there has to be another level of protection that comes with that style of chest protector. You know, we go back, to, back in the days, back in the 80s, when, uh, you know, Ricky Johnson's really, really, really good friends, Bob Hanna, had the flat jack, and it offered virtually hardly any protection at all, compared to today with the, uh, it's about a 75% bodysuit that actually covers the body with both plastic and with polyurethane underneath it for a, a good impact protection. You know, yeah. big difference between then till now. Now, I remember when I started racing in the desert, I had a Jim Davis chest protector and shoulder pads and made me look like a big old football player but you know those are those, those days are long gone down yeah the i remember my dad showing me his uh, hockey gear because uh -huh. when he started right when he was kind of getting into this he they didn't he didn't realize they made dirt bike specific chest protectors so he was wearing hockey gear um for the chest so the shoulder protection that he had back in the day well back in the back in the 70s to to make a full face helmet you stick a football mouthpiece and put it over in the front the jaffa Put, well, in the, the Jaffa, another probably thing. Probably before the Jaffa, yeah. There we go. Looks like number 117 got himself going again. So that was the rider we saw emptying his hydration bag, uh, hydration bladder. Oh, getting a little off course into that radiator. So maybe he was overheating. Maybe there was something else going on with the bike. But good news, he was able to work on it, able to get going again, and he's back on course. Yeah, he is a three brothers rider, by the way. Pretty good story. He come off and he finished the prologue. And not too, not too far distant. I think he finished like 48th, if I remember right. Yeah, Sean Kepler, he did a good job. But coming, uh, coming off course, he goes to start up his bike. He couldn't start it. And I go, what? Well, he's taking, taking a tow back to the pit. I go, what happened? He goes, well, you know, I'm having problems starting it, and probably because I have a hundred hours on the spark plug. <laughs> <laughs> it might on be a two covered stroke. in a little bit of oil. 100 hours on a two-stroke spark plug. Back in the day, we are lucky to get two or three hours on a spark plug on a two-stroke. So nowadays, you know, it's it's like It just shows just how the technology has changed, right? How it really that, has that, changed. The way it goes into the chamber, the way that the ignition happens, the way that all the combustion goes down. Um, it's so much more efficient at burning the oil and the gas. Well, and these TPI two-strokes nowadays as well. They're so fuel efficient, they get twice the gas mileage that a carbureted version would get. Yep. So, and now oh. we see that 2023 TBI coming out. So the bikes are continuing to evolve. Less vibration, more power to the ground. These riders are going faster and having a lot more fun. Oh, look at the line split here. I know, here. I love this. This, this is, is great. great. So we have a couple of riders going, taking the high route to get around. The other rider on the lower route is going... Well, maybe I should have taken Look, a high route. And then I have a feeling that the, the rider that we're seeing on the lower is actually going the correct direction because now these guys up here are trying to look to the left to see where, because they're, uh, remember, the GPS, right? 
So they're probably going to have to turn yeah. around and come back down that On your screen, that up. set of rocks on the left, that is virtually straight up and down. So what you're saying is we should jump off of it. No. <laughs> no, we're not uh, <laughs> We're not Graham Jarvis. Yeah, that would be fun to watch, though. I have Isn't to that guy that. incredible, though? What, 43 years old? I'm telling you, doing? that clinic was insane. If you guys ever get a chance to do the Graham Jarvis clinic, and don't be one of the riders that just sits there, because that's what's so interesting to me. There were so many riders that went to the clinic, and they really just paid to watch Graham Jarvis ride. And I was definitely out there trying to uh, pick up as much knowledge as I could from the goat of hard enduro. We say Cody Webb is the goat of hard enduro in the United States, but Graham Jarvis is definitely the g greatest of all time when it comes to hard enduro around the world. And he won the the first official King of the Motos That's back correct. in 2012. And this rider getting a little off course, working his way to the finish line. That's a cool shot too, the way that they're kind of riding straight towards the camera, zipping uphill. Yeah, a little bit of steez there. This rider is excited to be close to the finish line. That is for sure. So SRT Off-Road, King of the Motos, presented by RRC. If you guys have not checked out some of our sponsors, please make sure you go see those guys in the pits or online, anywhere their presence is around. Progressive Insurance, Optima Batteries, Can-Am, Ford, Bronco, Monster Energy, and Naito. Make sure you support those that are supporting the king of the motos. I'd like to mention something else too, Brian. They're going to be checking at the gate on the way out of Hammertown. If you don't have your official commemorative king of the motos t-shirt, they're going to turn you back around. So you might as well go to the vendor right now and go buy your king of the motos t-shirt just to make sure that they're not going to turn you around. At the yeah, gate. if anybody wants to see what the tucked in version looks like, you can come check out Mr. Chris Johnson. If you'd like to see the untucked version, you can come look at me. You can, you get, we're, we're models as well here. We make sure that everybody understands how good look, you can look in the King of the Motos uh, merch that is available at the vendor. You know, Brian, we don't even charge extra for that either. No, for being no. we're just good looking. Yeah, come in with us right now. And I'll, I'll pass the, the headset over to Tristan. Tristan Hart with us here. How you doing, Tristan? Good. How are you guys? Good to see you, brother. We're live. Yep. Nice, Tristan. Well, welcome to the booth, dude. Okay, well, we'll just ask you straight up. How did it go out there? Uh, it went okay, I'd say. Is everything okay? I'm black eye. Uh, do you have a black eye, Tristan? I shouldn't. I mean, I had a pretty good... Is that better? Yeah, so, okay, tell us. How did it go out there with your KTM-sponsored water bottle? <laughs> Not a good start, I'll be honest with you. Not a good start. This guy, an amateur... He seemed like <laughs> he kind of ghosted it up on the the first hill and kind of right into me. So I had to just wait for him, and he kind of just went up slowly, and I followed him, and that put me in like 14th or something off the start. And then I made a lot of quick passes. I was full, pretty aggressive, I'd say. So sorry if I was mean to anyone, but yeah, I, I was just on a charge, I guess, and uh, kind of just got in front of those guys and I knew that if I didn't get a gap on them that I would be doing the hard work of navigating and they could just follow me so I was like need to get at least like a 30 second gap so that they're navigating on their own then so that was kind of my plan if I did get in the lead and that's kind of what happened well tell us what you thought about that start because it looked like you guys you know, had about 30 40 riders there you all started straight going up that hill you said somebody got out in front of you so like what was your plan and obviously where did it backfire well, my plan was to get the whole shot and get up that hill first, <laughs> but I was, uh, and at least where I was going, I was second, just behind that one guy, and he was just, he is super sketchy, I'd say, so I was just honestly just trying to pick a spot where I might be able to pass him, and then I went on the right of him, and that's when he just went, poof, and I was there when he did that, so we just hit a little bit, and, and then he got just in front of me a bit where I just had to wait for him to get up, and then I followed him. So you said you were trying to get out in front, you know, to kind of, so they couldn't navigate off of you, right? Like, be able to see you, you had to get that distance in front of them. Mm. Did you felt like you accomplished that, or were you kind of like always looking over your shoulder to see where they were at and if they had, if you had dropped them? Well, I eventually I got a gap because I looked back at one point after like doing some zigzags and it was maybe a 30 seconds or a minute of ride and I looked back and they weren't there. So then I knew that 
they were having to navigate on their own at that point. So that's when I was like, we're good. Nice. Or I felt good. They might catch me if I got, like, later in the lap, I knew the navigating was going to be a little harder because it was a little more up and down, up and down, where the start was just pure single track, so you didn't have to look at the GPS so much. So I thought maybe they might, if I was leading near the end, that they might catch me just purely because I was going to have to do some heavy navigating, but it worked out. They marked the track pretty good, and it all worked out. So bike setup, right? We've got the prologue out of the way. We've got race one out of the way. We've got race two tomorrow. Like, how has the bike felt? Anything that you would change going into tomorrow? Honestly, this place is just, it makes the bike feel handled pretty badly, I'd say. This place is just literally brings out the worst in the bike, in my opinion. Maybe the worst in me, too. But it just, like, it's so, it's silty. So the dust is on all the rock, and then they all just move underneath you. And it's like trying to keep momentum is so hard because you just hit one rock and it slides off. And then it hits the next one and slides the other way. So you're, it's like, my friend said it's like riding a Bruck and Bronco. That's actually him right there. <laughs> he actually did really good. He got second in that race as a young gun. The little Kaba, I call him. <laughs> so we were talking uh, about the GPS aspect of this. There was one time it looked like we saw you do a nice little pivot turn to turn around. How many times did you get yourself turned around? Yeah, there was probably five or six times where I started doing some circles. <laughs> so just, yeah, you think, you look on the GPS and it looks like it veers to the right, but maybe there's two that veer to the right, so you take one, it's not the right one, you just go back and hit the other one. So it's it's hard to be perfect. I don't think anyone is always just going to get it right every time, especially in the desert here. There's just so many trails intertwining. So you can just take a educated guess sometimes hopefully it's the right one hopefully not but this year they do have some arrows so that's that made a big difference today that would have been a lot slower if they didn't have arrows so they definitely stepped it up and i think made it more of a race instead of a just stare at the gps and do some circles like we've done in some right. years past so growing up in canada riding in canada i would assume that the terrain there is absolutely nothing like this how long has it taken you to kind of like you know, be the Tristan Hart that we know out here in the desert of California. Yeah, definitely. This isn't this isn't my strong suit. I would say the dry. I just don't feel super comfortable. My tires on the ground here, but I seem to ride decent in these conditions. So I don't know. I just everyone's got to race the same terrain, and you just got to figure it out. And this is my third time here now. I think so. Definitely getting a little better at the navigation. A little better. At you know, just these, this crazy terrain they got here. It's just, it's hard to ride. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Well, you're one in 21. You've done, obviously, great so far with the third and then the win here today in the race one. You got race two tomorrow. Any lasting thoughts going in or just sleep, refuel, and get ready? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool this year. They have it two laps, and then on the second lap, we're doing, like, an extra 1.5 miles. So that's, I'm guessing they got something planned for us there that's going to be a little tricky, so... Looking forward to it. Um, hopefully they got some arrows out there so we're not doing circles. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what Justin's got planned for us this year. Right on, dude. Well, we really appreciate you dropping in and, and sharing some knowledge with us. Good luck. Get uh, get rested up. Look forward to watching you ride all hard and durably on your Red Bull KTM tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, man. All right, so we got Will Riordan coming on in. I'm going to step away for a second and let Mr. Chris Johnson interview little man Will. Okay, I have with me right now Will Reardon, and a great interview there, Brian. Will, hey, congratulations, second place, and you won the prologue. It's a good start of the weekend, don't you think? It is, yeah. No, thank you. Um, kind of honestly just riding around, but it, it's going good so far. So you're making quite a mark for yourself here lately the past couple of years. Of course, uh, being an Endurocross specialist and uh, your brother being more of a Grand Prix off-road specialist, but... If I remember right, two years ago at Glen Helen, uh, he actually beat you in one of the rounds. 
Yeah, yeah, I used to race hair scrambles and works and stuff. I'm actually got a, a moto background oh, um, and swapped over when I was like 15 years old. And then went to hard enduro and enduro cross when I was 16, 17. Um, but yeah, no, my brother, he's, he's a year younger and he started beating me, so I just left that and found another discipline. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a couple of other Australians that are doing really good here in the motocross scene, the Lawrence brothers as well. And uh, another Australian that's also doing good here in the Grand Prix scene is... Uh, 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 Jack Simpson. Yeah, Jack. Jack yeah, is yeah, doing now, really well too. In fact, by the way, uh, it was a 1-2 Australian uh, 250 sweep last weekend. Yeah, it was. Um, now we... In Australia, we don't well. We don't have that many people in general, and then so we don't have many riders either. But for whatever for for whatever reason, like we've got good riders, which is cool, um, and a lot of them are here in the US and then Europe. Um, you can we've got racing in Australia, but it's not that big. Um, so if you want to make it, you come here or Europe. So it's cool to see a lot of us out and about. Now the previous year, uh, you and your brother and your dad, you pr you pretty much stayed here on the West Coast. But uh, last year you decided to do, uh, of course, Angus was hitting up some GNCCs. And then, of course, you're doing all the hard enduro stuff all over on the Eastern Coast. Uh, what's your favorite, the, the, the West Coast or the East Coast? I'd have to say the East Coast. Um, we lived on the West Coast for a few years when we first moved over here. And then last year we moved to the East Coast. Um, as far as the land layout, like, it's pretty cool. It's nice and green, trees, a bit more like home. Um, but then over here is good too. There's so much variety. And luckily, with all the racing we do, we travel so much, so we get to do all of it. Well, now you get to the California desert, and I'm sure, you know, prior to you, you guys moving out here uh, a couple of years back, uh, you heard about this. You heard about this Johnson Valley place, and, of course, it had been well established for the king of the motos. And is there anything like you thought it was going to be, especially at this level where you're riding right now? Yeah, this place is hard and really unique. Um, I'm just watching the live feed. As you can see, like, it's so loose. And then you've got rocks. The rocks are quite grippy. But you'll be spinning in dirt, kind of lugging the bike, and then you'll hit a rock, and then it'll grip and go, and then you'll be back in the loose dirt. So it's really unpredictable. And, like, that's a flat rock there, but there's a lot of, like, smaller rocks that you can't really ride on and then they just stuff you up and stop your momentum so it's it's definitely it's dry and grippy but it's it's tough here so uh you know the california desert is it is a lot of the start of our motorcycle racing here in the united states all the way back to the the late 40s early 50s and uh to come out here right now for the the, the, the king of the motos and to try to compete against some of the best, I mean, you got some, some of the best riders in the world that are here with us this weekend. Here you are, man, top top prologue and, and second place here in, in, in event number one. And uh, that's a pretty darn good start right now. Yeah, no, Did, I'm happy. But like today is just qualifying, nothing really matters. But I'm for sure happy and, and uh, looking forward to tomorrow. So Tracy taking good care of us over here. You know, this is quite uh, quite an event. Now, are you telling your friends back in Australia, hey, go and check out our live feed right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put it on my story, put the link on, um, and I'll do it again tomorrow. But they, they love it. And it's pretty cool having people at home uh, watching and, and texts and whatnot. And my mum and dad are at home. My brother's racing. Yeah. Um, and different mates and whatever. Say hi to so your dad, Paul, for me. What was that? Say hi to your dad for me. Yeah, no, yeah. we'll do. We'll yeah. do. And, uh, any, any people in Australia you'd like to say hi to right now that they're listening to us? Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone. I'm going home next week, uh -huh. so I'm pumped to see everyone, friends and family, um, and then come back over here for more of this racing. Well, we wish you all the best of luck, and uh, you know, congratulations on a great start. Just keep the wheels moving. Exactly. steadily and carefully no, no. and uh i've been saying this same so so long and to so many different people smooth as fast smooth as fast definitely especially here especially here especially no, i appreciate here. it uh, you want to mention your sponsors yeah thanks to the whole rpm ktm fmf team uh soul mike 
my mum and dad, um, Dunlop Ties. It's everyone helps in, chips in, and that uh, appreciate it. Well, you know, both uh, both Bricky Johnson and Brian were asking me, and you know, who do I think is going to be on the top of the podium or making it to the podium? And you're definitely one of the people I mentioned because uh, you, you and Ryder are definitely the young riders that are starting to come up through the field, and people are starting to turn their heads. Yeah, now there's a few of us young guys, and then even under us, there's a lot, a lot of young kids. Um, a couple teams developing which is cool to help help the kids out um but i think the the sport's got a pretty good future i'm hoping and i'm thinking now some of these motocross kids that might be watching us on our live streaming and might listening to us uh what would you tell them uh to possibly get into hard enduro and possibly enduro cross as well get a trials bike that's what my dad always told me that and i never did it because i wasn't good at it wasn't fun but Lately, I've been riding a lot of trials, um, which helps a lot because not having that trials background. But I'd say that'd be my advice: get a trials bike and learn the fundamentals. Sure, gains on your 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 balance experience. Balance sure. skills, all the controls. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just fine tunes it and kind of fast tracks your progress. I'd say. Great words, man. Hey, Will, congratulations on on a great start of this weekend, and we wish you all the best of luck, both. Uh, both the, the second and third stage for tomorrow. Nah, and, uh, thank you. Uh, Brian, would you like to talk to him a little bit? Yep, we're all good. So uh, with that, Will, good luck, and hey, come talk to us again tomorrow. Okay? I hope so. I no, appreciate it. Thank all you. All right, Will Reardon, and, uh, number 39. We'll be seeing him tomorrow. Yes, Thanks, man. Nice. Well, it's awesome to get a little bit of a discussion there from Will doing so good in the prologue and then, of course, getting second there at the end of race two. But just coming in to drop in is the goatee, Mr. Cody Webb. Bro, how did it go out there? Uh, it, went, it was good and bad, a uh, mixture of it all, but I definitely enjoyed myself. I tried to wave at the live feed, but I think uh, whenever the I realized the helicopter was there, it was already too late, so I was just waving to the sky. But, uh, no, it was good. Um I took an interesting start position location. I feel like some of those guys chose a spot where it was only one line. They get pinched off. So I feel like I had some options. And the one I wanted to go got pinched off. So I went left and followed Ryder and was in second. And he quickly kind of got confused with GPS stuff. And I got in the lead. And I was like, all right, let's, let's ride this out. Literally dropped in the very first canyon and mangled my pipe. Like legit pancake. And that kind of caught me off guard and i rode like a goober up like revolution i think it's called so i went from first to fourth right there and then uh kind of regrouped kept going and i got into second behind um passing both um rider the blonde and cooper abbott and like one of the really gnarly technical things in the back probably the toughest part of the course today so i passed two guys in one spot and put a little bit of ground on them and basically just kind of rode my own race from there and then rolling into the finish they still had this morning's arrows up and it was close enough to the the gps course that i was running parallel with the course i mean i wasn't right on the line but i was like ah, i'm close enough and parallel and then they come in and they're like hey you missed we think you missed it i don't know tristan went over the hill and you did and i was like gosh dang this race like i've lost the race doing that before so oh that's I, true, I was yeah. gonna i was gonna be play hard like hardball and not go do it but it was it was literally right at the finish it wasn't that hard to turn around and do it again right so. so yeah we got a chance to see that pass on the live feed when it happened that was interesting because it looked like was it the the rockstar husqvarna rider that got stuck that was rider leblanc or was yep. that colton haker that was rider leblanc there okay at that cool point. Yeah, you look like, so he got stuck kind of on that left line, and you actually went far, kind of like, you could see that there, that's where the trail also went, but you kind of really took a wide line to come at that a little bit different. I literally just took a chance on that one. I hate following people, and right. I did that uh, during pre-running the other day, and I knew how tight and loose that spot is, and it just puts you in a really bad channel, and it's a, just a rotor chain guard destroyer in there, so I didn't want to be in there. I knew they'd be hung up in there, and there's two of them. I'm like, I have nowhere to go. I can't pass these guys. I was like, I'm going to take a chance. It might bite me in the butt, but I went out wide. And next thing you know, I was like, it made a left, and was I was way up high, and I had no idea that line was there, and I just dropped right in. And, I mean, you know, I put some time on that. That was a really good line, and just, just by chance. And like I said, I hate following people, and yeah. it worked out in that scenario. It could have backfired, but in the long run, it didn't. And that's part of the game sometimes, especially when we're out there racing, trying to get in front of other riders. Now, you mentioned 
pancaking your pipe. Now, we're riding two strokes where the pipe makes a big difference in the way that that bike delivers and creates power. So give us a little bit of like what that meant for you, right? As a rider now, knowing that you have that smashed pipe, like how do you approach obstacles differently? Um, you just got to plan ahead a little bit and give a little more gas. It just really cuts the power down quite a bit and makes the bike sound awful, like a like a huge exhaust leak. It probably did have an exhaust leak, I don't know. But it it wasn't, you know, the bike still ran. So, I mean, I wasn't pretty impressed by that. It was, I really flattened that pipe. And it was one of those things I was, it wasn't like I crashed and, and dented the pipe. Like it was, I was riding pretty reasonably fast and a little outcropping rock just, I didn't, it just bit me. I didn't even, didn't crash. It just literally folded the pipe in on itself. And I kind of bobbled and, um, makes me, I was like, my bike sounds funny, this thing. And I kind of looked down at one point and I saw it way out of position. So it still ran. I guess that's a testament to the Shurka that she takes a beating. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because y the professional riders, you guys choose not to run pipe guards, right? Because there's a chance that the flange, right? Where the pipe enters the engine could break when you hit those pipes where slower, more, um, you know, Aged riders like myself, we choose to run pipe guards. But tell me a little bit, like, why would you – is that a good reason for why you wouldn't run pipe guards? Like, why is it that majority of y'all don't run those? Yeah, in this case, it was probably good. I mean, if I hit, had the pipe guard on there, it still would have dented for sure the way I hit that thing. But it, there's a good chance it would have ripped the pipe out of the exhaust manifold there or, or broke that little manifold because there's a that, – that piece is replaceable on almost, most all the two strokes where the pipe goes in at in the header pipe. So – in that case, I just folded the pipe and dented it beyond belief, but, you know, I didn't rip it out of the, the manifold, and it's, it still kept running. It just did not run well. Well, now that we're back, right, we missed last year, but we're back right now. Like, what are your thoughts so far on the way that the race has run, right? We had our two-mile prologue. We had our 12-mile race two right now, getting ready for setup for race two tomorrow. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, so far, so good. I mean, this race is exactly what I anticipated. Um, a little bit faster. We saw a guy go down there on the screen, mm. um, but yeah, it is, uh, it's not too bad for us, for the top pro guys, but you know, this is a really good race for the amateurs to put it to the test of it, but not absolutely destroy these guys. Um, really one hard spot. So the prologue this morning, lining up at 7 a.m. was not, no, I'm not about that. Uh, this could have been our prologue. <laughs> I can understand that. Well, get ready for tomorrow, right? You know, rest up, fuel up and get ready to have some more fun. Um, you're going to be Everything you did today is going to get you in that front line for tomorrow. Um, same thing, just try to get out front and uh, and take away with it. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I wasn't too worried about this race because at the end of the day, I, I knew I'd be up near the front somewhere, even with a couple little issues there. So, you know, prologue today, I cruised around, enjoyed myself, kind of yelled at Max on the live feed when I go by, yelling cowboy or something like that. And then, um, you know, I came in, wasn't, you know, I just wanted to save energy today, and that's pretty much what I did. So really happy about that. And it went the wrong way, destroyed my pipe, still got third. I mean, we're in a good spot for tomorrow. And and you have a mechanic. You don't have to change it out. Yeah, I didn't have to change it. We, we took two of us to get the pipe off, though. Not nice. us. Two of them to get the pipe off. Two of so them, yeah. Like, one. I watched. I posted yeah. the video to Instagram. That's I, what I did. I was pretty – I apologized to him. I felt <laughs> bad. I apologized to myself. It was – it happens. Yeah, it does, man. Well, we really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, coming here and chit-chatting with us. And obviously, great job so far. And we look forward to seeing more of it tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. We're going to have Cooper Abbott coming up here to chit-chat with us just a little bit. Obviously, we talked to his dad. We talked to his dad. Uh, Destry Abbott, he's been out here in the desert for many, many times. So let, let's Chris Johnson drop the interview with Cooper, and we will get you more information. Hey, Cooper. Good to see you, man. And Wow, what an event so far, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, It's been a good time so far, and, yeah, that prologue went pretty decent and then that first race was just kind of a fun time got into a lead uh pretty early after cody smashed his pipe and just uh tried to ride my own race tristan got around me and then uh ran second for a little bit and man it was uh just trying to ride smart it's harder to lead and do the gps so kind of just set back a little bit and let those guys do the gps work and and just relax and take it easy so we can uh go have some fun tomorrow 
there was four or five of you that were mixing and matching, going back and forth. You know, Colton Hanker was in that mix too, Will Reardon, of course Tristan Hart. And, uh, man, you guys are going at it, man, and it, it looked pretty cool. What was the hardest part for you? How far in? Um, it was probably about halfway. It was about what Cody had talked about, that spot where he got around Ryder and I. And, uh, man, he took this line off to the right, and, and I saw it a little bit, and I was like, man, that looks a little risky out there. And, um, yeah, he got around both of us there, and I actually flipped to you and went and took his line. And uh, just because the line Ryder was in looked a little tough, and so I took his line and almost got around Ryder, but uh, – Got a little hung up there right at the end, but uh, that line was probably the most technical, but uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll have some surprises for us tomorrow. So now Colton and Cody are both the, the older guys in the group, and then you got yourself and Tristan are about the same age, and then you got the two young guns coming up here, both Ryder and Ryder and Will, you know, and the the talent is getting so close between all six of you, it's, it's getting pretty exciting. Yeah, definitely. It's uh. It's been pretty fun, so I think everybody's stepping up, stepping up their game, and uh, we're all trying to push the limits. I think that's the biggest thing. Tristan's riding really well, and so is my teammate Cody. And yeah, obviously, I think the older guys have the experience, but uh, I'm kind of now the middle-aged guy. I like to be in the younger guy, but uh, years go by, and you get a little older. And but uh, you definitely learn some more experience. So may not have the exact speed those young guys have, but uh, we can learn with experience. And I think tomorrow will be good. Well, the experience also teaches you to stretch everything out a little bit. And like, you know, we were talking earlier uh, with Will, uh, smooth is fast. It really is. And this really proves that smooth is fast in this particular amplitude. And, uh, but you come, you know, when you first started racing, you you did local motocross in Arizona. Then you started doing some desert racing. Then you're doing now the enduro cross, and now you cross over to the hard, the hard enduro. But uh, I think what, my personal opinion, your dad – doing what he does and then you tagging along and getting involved with his rider schools has really elevated your skills to a whole nother level absolutely yeah i mean i've ridden i feel like all types of riding and i think the last thing i have to do is now just a pro motocross so that'd be cool so i'd like to do that within the next couple of years but uh yeah i think i've done everything and obviously following along in my dad's footsteps is uh i've learned a lot from him and his classes and kind of uh i was a little late to it but uh really been enjoying the riding aspect and racing so uh yeah it should be a fun time well now uh, of course you're the 2022 juab extreme champion from this last year that's a fun event people never they go what the heck is a juab you want to say anything about it yeah that race is fun it's a one-off enduro cross in utah and i uh i hope they have it this year i know there's talk of it not happening so uh i hope it happens this year and it's always a fun preseason enduro cross race and you always get some fast guys so uh Fun battling, and uh, it's fun getting behind the gate again. Your favorite race of your entire career so far? Um, favorite race of my career? Um, that's hard to choose. I mean, I've done a lot of cool events. I think it's been cool this year uh, going over to Europe and doing the Super Enduros. Obviously, uh, the last one was a struggle for me, but uh, just to go over there and do those is a cool experience and, and something not many people get to do. So uh, that's probably one of the coolest things I've gotten to do. Obviously, the results-wise, I'd like for those to be better, but uh, – that's a pretty cool experience, and getting to race your dirt bike for a living in Europe is uh, pretty cool. Erzberg, Romaniacs, R- Romaniacs, and uh, TKO also on top of the list. Yeah, I haven't actually done Romaniacs or Erzberg, so uh, I'm hoping maybe this year or the following year is to uh, go to Erzberg or Romaniacs and kind of get my feet wet with those. So uh, it'll be fun. But TKO is really cool. I I missed out on this last year to uh, prepare for enduro cross, but uh, I think I'll be back this year. So. Go have some fun there. How do you finish in Dural Cross Seed? I finished sixth this year, so not super great. Just kind of a mid-pack guy this year. So a little struggles on my part, so uh, we'll perfect those and be better. Yeah, you missed a round or two, didn't you? No, I was at all of them. Uh, just literally just off that podium, I think I had four fourth places and two fifths. So it was just always short right off that podium and just mistakes on my part and still living and learning so uh we'll uh, use that experience from this year and or last year actually and take it into this year what was the hardest part for you today i think just the navigation obviously is a tougher part and there was nothing super crazy hard i would say uh, i'm sure they'll have surprises for us tomorrow but just the navigation is the hardest part if you if you're up front navigating you lose so much time so if you can be in a group and you can kind of navigate together it makes it so much easier and definitely following is uh definitely a better part well 
great job so far. You know, this top five. You can almost throw up the dice on this one. Who's going to win it? You know. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be a good one. So uh, it'll be a fun battle. I think the intensity is going to be pretty high tomorrow. I think everybody kind of uh, saved a little bit for tomorrow, and so uh, we're all close today. But I think uh, it's going to be a battle tomorrow. So we'll uh, all throw down, and we'll see how it ends up. What kind of start did you get in stage one? What start for today? Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty good actually. I was fourth up to the top, and then. Um, I uh, made a pass around, I think it was Corey, and then um, I saw a quick pass around Ryder there and squeezed in there, and then uh, Cody smashed his pipe, and I, I saw the lead, and I got a little excited there, and yeah, I actually led uh, until a little bit after the first check, so it was uh, nice to lead a little bit. I don't think I've ever really led one of these, so just good to get some experience leading, and just uh, you learn a lot being up front there, so just realizing I can run that pace, and it's not super out of the comfort zone, so that's the biggest thing there, and Learned a lot there, and then Tristan got around and just tried to follow him for a little bit. He's uh, he's going good, so uh, you can always learn something from everybody you follow. So just try to pick up on some stuff from him and hopefully take that into tomorrow. So now when you get out into the lead, you, you, you're thinking about some of our Saudi Dakar boys, you know, and the navigation plays into this big time. Here you are, you're leading now. Now you have to rely on your navigation to be able to lead the rest of the pack. You're thinking, oh, my gosh, you make one little wrong turn, then they're going to go and blast by it. You. you thinking that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, my main goal before the race was just be top five off the start and just kind of settle back and, and follow those guys. But uh, some things just change, and you get into a lead, and you're obviously never going to pass up on the lead. So uh, it was uh, not something I wanted to be doing, navigating up front, but uh, it's always fun, and it's a good learning experience, and uh, I think it will set me, myself up well for tomorrow. Great stuff. Cooper, always great seeing you and talking with you. Wish you all the best of luck tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate and, uh, it. Hey, would you please mention all your fine sponsors to help you out? Yeah, absolutely. The Factory One Sherco USA team has uh, been huge. So uh, the bike was awesome today, and uh, I think I finally won a pipe war with uh, Cody today. So <laughs> his was pretty smashed, and uh, usually I'm the one that loses that battle. So uh, that was fun. FMF helps us out there and helps supply some pipes because uh, they know we'll smash a few. So everybody else that helps us out, uh, just thank you. Say anybody special back in Arizona? Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank my wife and obviously my whole family is a huge support system. So uh, my little dog Jagger and just, uh, yeah, it's a good time back home and it's, uh, it's fun to go back home and enjoy life and then uh, get back to work. Best of luck, Cooper Abbott. Hey, wish y'all the best of luck. Turn them up tomorrow, man. Thank you. Love getting more feed here, looking at the riders that are finishing up. It looks like it is 3 p.m., so we're two hours into this race. Can you believe that this rider has been on course for over two hours? So they've got one more hour left before this is going to be over. But we have another rider in the booth with us. This one is actually named Ryder LeBlanc. So, Ryder, just talk to us, man. How the heck was it out there for you today? Oh man, it was it was pretty fun. Uh, started out this morning, uh, what I ended up like fourth in the first uh, qualifier, short lap, and then uh, on the uh, second one this afternoon, ended up fifth. And just trying to figure out the GPS stuff. It's a fun new challenge this weekend. I never raced with a GPS before, so trying to figure all that out. And I think if I can, and be a good day tomorrow. Yeah, Cody Webb mentioned that, that. I think he said he was behind you at one point, and you maybe kind of either had a hiccup where it was looked you were riding a little bit slower, maybe to make some uh, some mental adjustments for the GPS. So that has been something that you've been really working on because that's new for this event for you. Yeah, for sure. Like my main goal that second moto was just kind of I played with my GPS, zoomed in and out throughout the race, just trying to figure it out. And, because that was really the first time I got to test it in a race scenario. So made a couple adjustments and got it working better at the end. It's still tough for me to follow, but I'll figure it out. Yeah, man. So now that you're, like, obviously we've got race two tomorrow. So overnight, you're probably not going to learn how to use the GPS that much better. But in the long run, you know it's something to work on. What does that look like, right? Like, how do you go get better at using a GPS? Yeah, I mean, if I knew how to get better using GPS, I'd be better at it right now. But uh, no, I think uh, my main goal for tomorrow is just kind of get a decent start. Like Cooper said, get up in top five, just follow. I think we're all going to be struggling following. Like the track isn't what, like purposely not marked real well, so we have to use the GPS. And uh, I think uh, just 
whoever can read it the best tomorrow and stay out front and not make many mistakes is going to do well. It's going to be tough to learn overnight, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, and so this is your first year now. You just signed for the factory Husky team, right, being an official uh, yeah. you know, partner teammate there with, with Colton Haker. You were on a factory-supported team before. I believe you were on a factory bike before, but yeah, now yeah. – it's a little bit different, you know what I mean? Like, there's a paycheck involved. There are assumptions that you're going to perform for the team. Like, what does that feel like? And I'm, I mean, honestly, how accomplished do you feel now being able to have a, achieve this moment in time? Oh, it's awesome. It makes uh, it takes a big weight off my shoulders knowing that I have a really solid team behind me this year. And, uh, it takes a lot of worries away about, like, you know, if the bike's going to be ready to go because in the past I was working on it and, like, getting it ready before the races. And now I have no doubt in my mind that the bike will be good. It's just me that i got to worry about. Yeah. So, again, you've been doing this for a long time. I believe you started in your young teenage years racing hard enduro. You're in your early 20s now? Yeah, 21. Okay, so, yep. you've got, so you've got probably five, six years of racing hard enduro. What are your thoughts on where this is going next? I, I think just in the last couple of years, it's gone really well. Just as this series, uh, Josh and the whole U.S. hard enduro crew, they're doing a great job. And happy we're back at King of Bows. I've never done it, but I'm ha I know – uh, a lot of guys have been here before, so it's good that this is back on the series and excited for the series this year and just, yeah, let's go racing. Yeah, man. Are you going to get a chance to go to Hawaii for the second round? Um, I'm not sure. I don't I don't know if we're going or not yet. I don't. That's not in the in the contract you signed? Yeah, it's not one of the premier <laughs> rounds and uh, it's tough to get to Hawaii, so uh, just probably focus on the races here and do a couple over in uh, Europe if I can. Yeah. Is there any talk already of you being able to go to Europe to do any official races? Um, or are you just kind of trying to see what can work out? Yeah, it's, it still just depends on the schedule. Hopefully get back over to Erzberg, stuff like that. But mainly focus on the series here and Enduro Cross again. Okay, and then so you mentioned Enduro Cross. Are there other small series that you do? Like do you potentially, excuse me, do any Enduro racing, maybe a National Enduro Series or local things like that, local hair scrambles? Like is that ever something that you've raced before? Oh, yeah, for sure. My background is like GNCC hair scramble. Okay, so, okay. Uh, yeah, in the past I've – I mean, the last two years, I've only focused 100% on the hard enduros, but here and there, I do a couple to like just kind of get my speed back and uh, stuff like that. So different, different. Took a different route than I thought I was with the hard enduros last two years, but it's a good change. I'm loving it and happy I did. It worked out. With that, with that style of racing, would you have always been on a two-stroke, or have you kind of been a rider that's chosen four strokes for more uh, enduro cross-country racing, and then two strokes for the hard enduro? Um, yeah, I've always been a person who uh, I prefer two-stroke for sure for hard enduro and four-stroke for faster stuff in enduro cross. I mean, two completely different bikes, and they have two completely different purposes, and it's perfect for what we do nice. on both sides, enduro cross the four-stroke and hard enduro the 300. You can't beat them. How do you make that switch, or is it – is that switch hard, right, from going for maybe one week and you're riding a four-stroke? And obviously there's so many other things that come into play when riding a four-stroke. Bike setup could feel a little bit different. Then coming back to hard enduro, you're on a two-stroke. Like, where, where, how does that feel for you? Yeah, I mean, luckily the way our series, the two series we do work out, like, it's a pretty decent, like, I mean, we don't ever have enduro cross during hard enduro season. So pretty much full-time 300 uh, for hard enduro. And then after the hard enduros, like at end of August or so, switch back to the 350, go on the four stroke and focus on enduro cross. And it takes a day or two to get used to them, but uh, we got them all dialed in pretty good. So Nice. Well, you ready for tomorrow? I think I'm ready for tomorrow. It's, it's going to be a challenge. I'm excited for it. I'm, I'll just see what the pace is, settle in, hopefully come out on the top. Yeah, we'll so see. staging being 8 a.m., right? Race starts at 9 o'clock, dude. It's still going to be chilly. Yeah, it's going to be a chilly start. So you guys are going to be starting maybe in jackets, vest, or something we like that. Be. And then probably halfway through that first lap just wanting to shed clothing as much as possible, yeah. right? Like it's oh, gonna be definitely. Pretty nice. Well, the thing is, you have some big shoes to fill, right? That's what normal people would say. But right now, I have to say they probably got you too big of a jacket because right now you've got a big jacket to fill. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think any clothes fit me tight. I'm pretty small, but... Yeah, that's all right. You're wiry. <laughs> that's the way I like oh, to look yeah. at because I'm a small guy too, but I'm a wiry character. So in yeah. that regard, we just we, we 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 bring it, and it's all good. Yeah, sweet. Sure. Well, great work, dude. Thank you for coming and chatting with us. Good luck tomorrow, dude. We look forward to seeing you, yeah, on, the, thank uh, you. on the big screen. Oh yeah, we'll be up there.
All right, so as we said just a little bit ago, it looks like we're coming up around 310, so we've got 50 more minutes for the riders that are on course for them to finish. Now, even if they don't finish, they will still be able to race tomorrow. This just puts them at the very back of the pack if they do not finish their course today. Looks like that rider there having a ton of fun getting to the top, slipping and sliding, trying to keep that front end down. He's just having too much fun. That's what it looks like when you're on your dirt bike enjoying this single track. Those guys, though, are having a conversation about how they can figure out <laughs> how to get themselves down and continue onward with this trail. So we got the SRT, King of the Motos, of course, presented by RRC. Progressive Insurance, Optima Batteries, Can-Am, Ford, Bronco, Monster Energy, Nito, all supporters of this awesome event. So thankful to be back with King of the Hammers here at Johnson Valley OHV area. Woo, Chris, what are you thinking? I'm thinking tonight's going to be an absolute blast. We're going to well, watch on the big screen Supercross in front of us. Hey, you in the audience here, you all having a good time this weekend? That's what we like talking about. Tell all your family and friends what's happening because it only happens right here in Johnson Valley. But uh, Brian, you know, Brian Pierce working with me and Ricky Johnson this morning. Ricky will be back with us tomorrow. And, uh, man, lots of great information, lots of cool stories. I love hearing those, man, about the riders on course because – uh, granted, we have amazing coverage, but in the long run, we can't see it all. So to be able to get some of those stories, especially listening to like it, Cody Webb smashing his pipe and everything. It just fills in all the gaps of what we're seeing here. Yeah, it's just, absolutely. It completes the whole package. Yeah, for sure. And of course, Look at this. Our, friends and, and our friends and family out here in front of us watching, watching on the big screen while we're watching on the small screen. Great coverage this year. Uh, this is absolute best coverage I love what they were just showing us right there. You can see that amazing downhill, that sandy downhill as they were working their way into this lava field of rocks. So that's the, what they're talking about, how it's just so different here when you have all of that sand and then the rocks hidden underneath. And then sometimes you've got to get through all of that just to get to the rocky terrain. Well, then you have 10 or forward. 20 riders go through it and it changes the whole, the whole, uh, the whole outcome of all the ground underneath it you know turns up tr turns up the rocks puts dirt on top of the rocks makes it even more slick and talking about tires we've had some great chats about the tires this absolutely, weekend absolutely absolutely i love watching this guy just motoring his way up there but look at he's doing a really good job keeping his momentum let's see how he does with this he's kind of pitter pattering a little bit but let, listen coming from me i'm totally fine with a little bit of pitter patter with your feet but he's definitely doing a good job keeping that momentum. He's sitting down a little bit more than I'd like to see. But you know the thing is, again, over two hours on the motorcycle so far. So I'm pretty sure he's pretty smoked. You know, and I guarantee you, this guy has gone down. His bike has hit the ground at least quite a few times. Look at the look at the view that, from on top of the mountain. Yeah, th those are the so. I like to go, there's a race in Colorado I like to go to every year called the Shady Burrow Enduro. Nice two-day event, about 200 miles of single track in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest part for me is when, I'm again, North Texas guy, right? When I come across a serene, oh, picturesque that. view like that, I just have to stop and I have to take in the view. And I, I don't care that I'm racing because in the long run, things like that are just, that's part of it. That's part of the journey. That's part of the adventure and the experience that you're on. And I have to take those things in. And I'm hoping that these riders as well are not so tired that they can at least enjoy the view a little bit. Well, it's like we had a chance of talking to Mikey Childress earlier today. And he's a, you know, many, many time champion out here in Johnson Valley racing District 37, National Hair and Hounds. And of course, Baja. But in the springtime, what happens, we get all sorts of rain out here, and all of a sudden the wildflowers start popping out. I've been on top, coming off of the top of a ridge, and you look into a valley, and it's a big valley of yellow, just all these wildflowers. Oh, that'd it's be beautiful awesome. out here in the springtime. Yeah, I bet that would be super cool. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that now just looking at all the, uh, all the creosote bushes and the pucker bushes. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize creosote is pretty wild. Here's a little trivia quick trivia deal for you bring it all of our telephone poles okay they get coated with creosote well what they do they have big old vats of water and they boil it with the creosote bushes in it <laughs> and they roll the telephone poles in this creosote oil that's in the water and it seals up the wood for our telephone poles that's that is a lot of, that's a little bit of knowledge for sure 
I didn't even have to go to YouTube. We just get to listen to Chris Johnson with all that. You <laughs> know, good, uh, Brian. It, one thing I noticed, we're talking about all the terrain. I haven't seen any cactuses, and I'm super thankful for that because I've been to Baja. I've run into a cactus, and I've had to spend three hours picking out all the needles. There's and not I, too many cactus on this side of the planet. Now, when we come closer to the Colorado River, there's a couple of fields out there that are full of choya. Mm. Now, there's more choya. Like around North Anderson. Look at that down. And mm. this side off of Boone Road and here at the Hammers, there's really not that many cactus out here per se. The cactus are a little bit more to the northwest of us here, probably about 10, 10 miles as the crow flies. And then you get a little bit closer to the Colorado River. And then the, the choyo cactus, they call it the jumping cactus, starts jumping out. There's a couple of fields I could just imagine there's an old movie back in the 60s called The Naked Prey. And uh, I remember, and what happened was these savages kidnapped this guy. They took off his clothes, and they chased him through a field of cactus naked. It was called The Naked Prey. And I was thinking about that when I see big old fields of choya. And if you ever, oh, good story about choya. We're up in Oatman with my dad, and he, we used to wear sandals. And he'd wear socks with the sandals. He that kicked guy, a huh? he guy? kicked a choyo ball on the tip of his foot, and it stuck. And so we go into into Oatman, and uh, one of the the store proprietors goes, "I have tweezers. You can borrow them, but you can't buy them because these are mine, because this happens quite often." Yeah. Anyway, I'm choyo's surprised gnarly. he doesn't have a rental fee for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, but yeah, there's not that much cactus on this side of the hill. But you go farther out to North Anderson, the cactus starts becoming more prevalent. And there's some more cactus out there by Cougar Buttes as well. Well, all I know is I'm very thankful for these racers. And I'm sure they're thankful as well that they don't have, they don't have to add that on top of the possibility. Because how many times have we seen racers lay it over, right? Just think oh, yeah. if you're laying it over like that in a hard enduro event into a cactus and you just sit down and realize. Look at this view, Brian, oh, Brian coming into Hammertown from the top of the mountain. And what's nuts is just how this this view will be covered with uh, campers, UTVs, spectators in just over a week. Oh, oh it looks like we got a rider going down here. You know, it's it's either hit or miss. This weekend, of course, not as many people as we're going to have at the tail end of next week with, with, with the hammer cars. But I kind of like it because we're concentrating on our motorcycle on specialists, motos, yeah. you know. And it's just great that they're having us back. I mean, that's the thing. We have to give that big, huge thanks to King of the Hammers for having us back out here at their event here in Hammertown, which is insane how vast and how much this this uh, event has grown. Great job done by, done by Justin Lineweb here and his entire crew in putting together an awesome, challenging course for King of the Motos. The drone coverage just blowing my mind, Brian. Dude, they're doing a phenomenal job, and it is pretty crazy how many times they have to keep swapping out because of the batteries on those things, right? Like, sure, they have fly time and everything, but they can only make it so far, and they've got to bring it down. So then they bring up another drone, plug it on into the feed. Well, just as much as that, we have four around. or five people inside of a production trailer switching from one drone to the next and from one live camera to the next. And it's constant. They have all these about... 12 or 15 screens up against the wall and they switch from one camera to the next yeah it is a full blown TV production crew that is hap that is going on here which is just again for a dirt bike race that is amazing that we are able to have that look at this man this rider is just having so much fun out here in the uh, Johnson Valley OHV area well check this out Brian there's more coverage on our live streaming than there is for AMA Supercross We got a rider coming. It looks like a, looks like he's on a 450, or maybe a 250 CRF. No, it's a two-stroke. Uh, gas, gas, baby. It is a gas, oh, gas. Oh, that's, that's a beta. There we it's go. It's beta. That red's throwing me off. Yeah, that's what's. And man, there's so many. So I ride a Sherco, right? So it's a little. Like we were talking with Cody Webb, Coop Rabbit. They're on the Factory One Sherco team. I am not on the Factory One Sherco team. My factory uh, sponsorship is my myself and my wife and my family. But um, we've just got so many different bikes out here, and it's interesting that the Japanese manufacturers have still not really brought two-strokes back. 
that they don't see this market that, that they don't see that they're losing out on this market and it really is the european brands that are still kind of like staying strong yamaha of course is still keeping their two strokes out and they do a little bit of development every now and then on their bikes but they don't need to we do know the yamaha platform is a phenomenal platform with the two strokes that they do have but it's just crazy that some of the other japanese manufacturers haven't brought some form of a two-stroke back for this audience that obviously is looking for two-strokes well you remember back in the 80s ktm you know on the world grand prix circuit did really really well with their 250s and their 500s and their 540s and their 550s but little question for you a little trivia i love flinging trivia to brian and he likes it too now ktm restructured their entire program toward the off-road probably about 50 maybe 17 years ago and it started really getting popular well, it was when pierre bought them right because they were the yes. white bikes they went bankrupt and then it's the pierre group bought them Correct. and that's when they were like you know what we're gonna go where did the financing century. come to retool the entire ktm yeah. market where did that come from say it again where did the financing come for retooling ktm in that big changeover oh in the i 90s? have no idea tell me tell me you're gonna love this i am india and china number one purchase of KTMs was their mopeds. Makes sense. The little 50 cc Millions and millions CCs of those dang mopeds were sold, and that financed the upgrade tooling for KTM. That's awesome. You gotta yep. make it work. Yep. You gotta figure it out. One way or another, you know. So the rider we were just seeing there is Adam Does Dirt Bikes. If you guys do not follow him on YouTube, he is a hoot. So He's guys cool. like Highland Adam's Cycles, Morgan great people. Highland Cycles, myself, we have my Seat Time YouTube channel, Adam Does Dirt Bikes and his YouTube channel. There's plenty of guys putting out awesome dirt bike content. So if you do not enjoy some of these channels, you need to make sure you go out there and check them out. Obviously, if you're watching this, you're going to be on King of the Hammers YouTube channel. So you enjoy YouTube. Go follow some of these other guys that are out there making all this great content and having fun. Good job, Adam, getting race number one done. I don't know how you finished in the prologue. I'm going to look that up really quick so I can talk about that for a second. Well, again, I'd like to encourage all of you to share the links and any sort of pictures and stories here at King of the Motos. And uh, some of our riders are starting to come in after getting beat up after our prolong this morning for stage number one. Stage number two will be taking off tomorrow at eight o'clock. Now last weekend I was, at, I was in Prim, Nevada for the works race. And uh, we had seven o'clock sight lap. Well, that sight lap went out for the motorcycles and it was all the water put on the course turn to ice so we're gonna we're gonna go to a commercial break here right now so really uh like to thank each and every one of you for joining us and being a big part of our king of the motos racing family and again share with all your family and friends and with that we are going to commercial There's only one place to go to do your rig right, and that's at Four Wheel Parts. Now is the time for bigger tires and larger wheels. Now is the time to lift your Jeep at 4WP.
choice of champions. Team Shocks, the leader in off-road shock technology. All right, Chase, number 23, it's 2023. This championship's yours, let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys, it's not over yet. Big dog still gotta eat. <laughs> Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. I've been modified, 45, fitting like a Mordecai. I ain't regular, feel like Jordan wearing 45. Shining like a real anthem. Shawty saw my wallet, now she think a nigga handsome. Whoa, telling me she wanted me to hammer. Trying to get saved, baby, I am not the answer. No, I can never trick, trick, trick. Let's the bitch with my bitch with a kiss on my lips, like, ah. Uh, I am not a pimp with a limp. I'm a man with a gift, and I'm doing my shit, like, ah. Uh, what you all about? What you dollar about? Again, we're back on live. King of the Motos 2023 version. I'd like to thank all of our fine sponsors again. SRT Off-Road, Progressive Insurance, Optima Batteries, Nito Moose, Monster Energy, Bronco Cars, Ford, Can-Am. And I'd like to mention all of our other supporting sponsors. BJ Fresh Squeeze Lemonade, VP Racing Fuel, Triple S Concessions, the Donut Cafe, Rocky Mountain ATV MC, Potato Hut, PCI Race Radios, Miles Mountain Firewood, KOH Instacart and Showers by Finish Line, Cheaper's Jamboree, and Dang Brothers Pizza. And they are courtesy shout outs again. So with that, oh, Hey, Justin, great work this weekend. Now you're starting to see your hard work come into play. Here we are. The first stage is complete. How are you feeling about this so far? I'm feeling really good. The, uh, the team here has just been knocking it out of the park. We've been, uh, we've been able to keep the course fairly uh, clear. No, not too many bottlenecks, so I'm excited to see that. We do have the one back on the switchbacks, which I was kind of prepared for, but it is what it is. The prologue this morning went off without a hitch. It was pretty exciting. And uh, now the second race is, uh, you know, the pros, of course, finished it two minutes faster than I thought they would. But, hey, it happens. But all in all, it's I got to say thank you to everybody, and it's it's really going well. Now, when you now, how long ago did you first start setting up the course here? I started uh, five months ago. Uh, just riding out here, we had a meeting with Dave Cole, and decided King of the Motos was was on the schedule again. And then we came out here, started looking at course. We have some course tracks from previous years that we're able to use like in today's in uh, in today's racing. But uh, all tomorrow, we probably spent, uh, I don't even know how many gallons of gas and rear tires, but four months of riding on the other side of the valley. A lot of new track as well for tomorrow, correct? Yeah, we've uh, utilized some of, uh, some of the last time we ran over on the hammer side track but the transitions are all different and then we've uh, we've definitely added probably I'd say 40% brand new that 
no one's seen yet. Now, something I heard, now, going up Sledgehammer instead of down? No, uh, we're actually skipping Sledge, but we're coming down Jack. Oh, coming down Jack, okay. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we have a new trail right above Jack that the cars haven't, uh, haven't seen or been on yet. It's one we've put in, uh, we call it Jackknife. So that'll be an exciting, exciting spot to watch tomorrow. And now for next week when the cars start coming out here, how much of this course are they going to be using? Uh, it's hard to put it in percentage, but I would say the cars will utilize a lot of your Hammer Canyons, of course, where we're using uh, some of those. And uh, Dave has been uh, looking at some of the... Uh, some of our tracks, and I think he's going to utilize a couple of our new, mm. new single tracks uh, to be some of the transitions for him. He's really been putting in a lot of time to make the car course, uh, you know, more difficult and longer and exciting. It's it's going to be fun to watch the cars. You know, I I'm really impressed with our drone coverage this year. It it just it's off the charts. You know, Brian and I were just talking about that. Some of these views from the bluffs looking into the valleys from on top of the riders dealing with these obstacles and these gnarly rock sections, these uphills and downhills, these crevices. I mean, it's, and for the drone pilot to find these areas and to be able to capture this on our view screen for us to see is awesome. Yeah, I've actually gotten to watch more live footage this year than I've ever had been able to before, and the coverage just blows me away. You know, the, I, the spectators ask me, where's the best, best spot to go watch out on the course? And I give them one or two, and I said, but you want to end up in Hammertown watching the live coverage on the Jumbotron because it's the best view of the entire course. It's just amazing. Well, you take a look at, you know, Amy Supercross. Yeah, it's pretty good coverage. It's inside of a stadium. It's nothing compared to this. This is spread out over miles and miles and miles, and it's right here up close and personal. Yep, we are, we are standing right next to... All these guys that are struggling a little bit, they're tired, they've been riding all day, mm -hmm. and the fact that we get to be there next to them, feel what they're feeling, you know, we don't get to bounce off the rocks quite as, as much as they do, but it's still a very exciting view. Now, what sort, what sort of racing background do you have? So I started uh, just in the local district here when I was about five years old. Mm -hmm. um, picking and choosing the races that were close, like Grand Prix, Heron Hounds, that sort of thing. Uh, the second year that King of the Motos, it might have been the first year actually, King of the Motos was out here. I rode out with my dad and watched uh, Destry Abbott go up Jackhammer. And uh, he was just, he just posted a picture the other day of where he's sitting off the bike in the 450s up in steam and he's up in steam. And that was the moment I started Hard Enduro right then i looked at the guy next to me and i said i'm going to come back next year and the guy goes oh yeah what do you ride i said kx 500 and he goes yeah yeah whatever <laughs> so next year i showed up my kx 500 asking larry rossler for advice on how to set the bike up he just shook his head and walked away but uh i made it 12 miles that year with jimmy loose's course it was quite a feat for me i i enjoyed every minute of it uh, from there I started riding for uh, the R&D side of Kawasaki. I was on KX250 for a few years. Finally finished a King of the Motos, you know, one of Jimmy's all-day races. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And I've gone uh, into Enduro Cross. I, I raced a Beta for two years, Enduro Cross and Hard Enduro. And then the last two years I've been with uh, the TM team, factory team out here. And we've done the entire... Uh, West Coast Hard Enduro Circuit and all the Enduro Crosses for the last two years. It's been a lot of fun. What a gas. And I've, I've seen you at quite a few of them as well. And, uh, you know, the Enduro Cross is, uh, has come into a whole other realm as well. And uh, getting more and more technical as, as, as we speak. But the riders, the, 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 the quality of the riders, it's getting to be a lot more competitive from what I can see. Yeah, absolutely. The, the level that the pro riders are riding at now is even just hard for someone in the A-class to fathom. Some of the stuff that they're able to hit and accomplish, we can only just stand there and shake our heads at. So the courses in Enduro Cross have gotten more difficult, and we've really enjoyed that. And uh, it's a struggle for all of us promoters putting on these hard Enduros to make a course that an A guy or a B guy can get around and at the same hey, time hey, challenges the pros. So tomorrow with our two-lap format, I'm hoping that second lap, I've got quite the uh, 
quite the obstacle is the last one coming in that should put him to the test. You know, as Ricky Brown and I have been talking about, you know, it's, and, and you mentioned it in our writers' meeting yesterday, every single stage gets more and more difficult, less and less marked, and it's going to become the navigation part of the GPS starts coming more into play. This is more GPS navigation at this event than we've ever had at the motos. Yeah, we've uh, we've definitely stepped it up with the GPS navigation aspect of it. We do put more course markings than maybe Jimmy did with just uh, you know some dangerous spots or when the guys are going fast across the you know a, a interchange. I I like to to have it where they can be you know not be staring at their GPS and trying to race across the a canyon, but uh, it's it's quite an experience to put on a GPS race and it's quite an experience to race one so it's been exciting. Now a lot of people don't realize all the BLM submittals that must be done prior to an event like this takes place well before six months before the event. Yeah the, uh, they kind of give us an area that uh, we can work in and then I submit my maps to Dave Cole and then he takes them and submits them to BLM and and then if I need to change a canyon or two, I can definitely reach out to them later and fix it. But there's quite an uh, extensive preparation process for all this. It is. Now, back in early 2000s, I, I come back out to desert racing. And, of course, you did some District 37 desert racing, I, oh. I take it. Yep. Uh, with any particular club? No, I've uh, never been affiliated with a club mm -hmm. just because I bounced around and did them when my schedule allowed. Mm -hmm. And just never never got into the club scene well early 2000s i brought back a legal smoke bomb at a hare and hound and i've done about a dozen of them now and i actually get a permit from the air district to do a legal smoke bomb that's too so cool i've been seeing them on on facebook and stuff yeah in the last so, so maybe one of these there. maybe one of these years king of the motos will be able to do a smoke bomb for the final round i think so that'd be I definitely cool. want to talk about it and they get a keep permit it for mind. it yeah legal Legal. Now, yeah. <laughs> now, Mikey Childress might uh, disagree with this, but Checkers actually have been doing smoke bombs off and on for the last, you know, 40 or 50 years, but they don't get permits for it. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it's all good. But uh, no, we're looking. We'll look into that. And uh, you know, this King of the Motos thing, it's uh, really all of our all of our friends out here that are watching our live streaming need to really share. All of our links tomorrow. We have all sorts of racing action, like uh, Justin and I were talking about. Awesome drone coverage. You don't see this anywhere for this type of an event ever. So uh, this is by far. You know, uh, did you get a chance to watch the Dakar Rally this year? I just was able to follow it, you know, on social media and get yeah. the update every morning when I woke up. But no, uh, I didn't catch any live coverage or anything like that. But I was still excited to cheer on the USA guys and and watch it and enjoyed it. It was, it was really cool this year. And, you know, of course, Skylar House, at least making the podium. And, uh, of course, I, I, I knew Toby Price. He used to run a couple of our day in the dirts. And then, uh, man, Ricky, Ricky's, you know, I invited Ricky to come out. He chatted with us two years ago, chatted with Ricky and I. And Ricky Brayback and, you know, what a bulldog. And, you know, of course, he, he got injured. And same thing with Mason Klein, you know, and, the, the, the quality of that individual, people don't realize that kid is a navigational genius. Mm -hmm. And I'm serious yeah, about this. A uh, good friend of mine, Scott Whitney, started the Sonoran Rally back about 10 years ago. And uh, he's passed it on now, but one of his students for following the navigation and doing writing up road books is Mason Klein. Oh, very cool. So actually, uh, Ricky Brayback and Skylar Howe both get traveling, um, practicing road books from Mason Klein oh. to be able to move on. So That's neat. I'm hoping Mason makes it, uh, makes it out tomorrow. Yeah. I had uh, mentioned we'd like to get him up in the booth if, if they're able to make it out here. So. Absolutely. I invited you know, both him, Skyler, and Ricky as well. Very cool. And we'll, we'll see. Yeah, but anyway, it's so cool that we're starting to see some of our American riders doing this abroad stuff. I mean, that is by far the gnarliest off-road race in the world. It really is. Yeah, it's it's a different level. Yeah. I, I don't even know how to look at a map, let alone what they get to do. So. I can't even imagine the stuff. And the stuff that they do from one stage to the next and being able to get enough sleep, being able to get enough rest, 
get enough food and nourishment during the entire time. And people don't realize sometimes they're on a motorcycle for 13, 14 hours. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a long, that's a long, long day. time. I mean, yeah, it's so, so this is pretty cool, but this is a great event. Hey, 180 entries. Yep. Total, and that's we had 25 that didn't make the prologue, though. Yeah, we've uh, we had quite a few DNFs or just issues. bike issues or whatnot. But um, the kind of plus of that is they can start tomorrow morning. They'll just start in the back. So I'll be calling all their names when we get lining up riders at 8 a.m. and uh, we'll see who's there for the 9 a.m. start. Looking forward Very to cool. it. Very cool. Hey, you want to mention your crew? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Walter Marioncheck has been out here. Um, we talked about the four months, the last four months of riding, and he's there every time I go out. Uh, Braden, my nephew, is there almost every time we go out as well. Just so I got to get it to those guys helping me out here, making sure I don't, you know, get stuck out here or anything like that. And then uh, my wife for putting up with me through the whole six months of it. Uh, she's couldn't do it without her. The rest of the team out here. You know, that they, they help me run all my volunteers, all my checkpoints, all my course workers. None of this would happen without them. And then, of course, we got the hammer team that builds a city in my backyard, you know, living just across the street. I get to experience this for the next two weeks. And I, I say get to, you know, sometimes people might look down on it because it's, you know, makes the highway busy or something like that. But I mean, look at what they, you know, we get to experience in our backyard. We can put up with a little traffic for a week, you know. Um, but yeah, the, the, the King of the Hammers team, um, you know, from advertising to PR to media to making sure all our signups are done correctly, it's just, it makes it uh, pretty easy on my part. So. It's a big city of workers that put this thing all together. It's Absolutely. not just one individual. Of course, Dave came up with the idea, you know, many, many years ago, and uh, then you started run, running under the shirt tails and following the lead there. And now you're a big part of it with the King of the Motos. Yeah, I got to hand it to Jimmy for starting this. He really started hard enduro in America. I want to, you know, I, I, I don't know of any other race, and that may just be my ignorance that was hard enduro 17 years ago. You know, I, I don't, I just don't know. So Jimmy started this, and now look at what it is. We've got um, a sixth round premier hard enduro series, and we have an East and Coast AMA sanctioned hard enduro championships. There's, it's just uh, it's pretty cool to come up through that, and then what Dave's built out here with with King of the Hammers and letting us be a part of it is really amazing, and I can't say thanks enough. Well, I know with Brian, Ricky, and myself, we all thank you for your hard work and effort and energy, and we know all the work that you put into this thing. You know, of course, I've been putting on races for 40 years now and working them. I know behind the scenes there's so much stuff. People have no idea. What takes place behind the scenes to make things like this happen? Yeah. And uh, we all appreciate what you do, man. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for being here. And speaking of that, i got to get back to work because we're almost ready to go course cold here and make sure all my guys get in from checkpoint three and make sure everybody's doing good. So thanks for having me on. Good job, Justin Line. We're with us here, our track marshal and uh, promoter pretty much, along with Dave, putting on this king of the motos. Right, thank you, man. Yeah, we got about 20 more minutes until this event is over. Looking like we're sitting at that 340 mark. So we're gonna have about four o'clock. The course will be closed and riders, if they are out there and hit a checkpoint still, they will be told which direction to head back to camp because they wanna get this course sweeped so they can get ready for race two tomorrow. Our finale of the 2023 King of the Motos. Now there has been some course closures at certain checkpoints at certain times and we are coming up to that four o'clock mark just like brian was saying and it's so important that we do not let the riders go beyond that particular point beyond that time for safety concerns because you sure in the heck don't want to be stuck out here in the desert especially as cold as it can get in the nighttime oh my gosh it was so chilly last night it was to the bone yeah but look at the beautiful day that we oh, had in front of right? i hope tomorrow's the same way yeah man that guy that rider right there super stoked to be finishing up his lap here but just think about this right it is when we were just talking about 340 he has been out there for two over two and a half hours right for 12 miles uh yeah, so Daniel. not the easiest right not the easiest yeah but when you're coming back into hammertown and you're you're seeing i don't know how many times you come in 
and you see the finish coming up and go, oh, after 100 miles of desert racing, and I, I'm done. I can't go another mile. And then you see the city when you come back into the pits. And it's a, it's a wild feeling. You can't really describe it, Brian. It's so wild after so many miles. And here they come into Hammertown onto the car course to go take that checkered flag at the finish. Yeah. I have a small understanding because I did the hare and hound that happened out in uh, close to Lubbock, Texas, closer to Post, Texas, a handful of years ago. And I believe it was around about two loops that were 40 plus miles. And that is a lot. Look, you think, ah, 80 miles isn't that bad. But in the long run, when you go out for 40 miles, come back in, gas up, fuel up and everything, and go back out, when you come in after that 80 plus miles of a day, only seeing people, right, being back at camp one time, that was intense. I would love to have been able to do different hare and hounds out here. Now, especially with the terrain, it is so different out here. And watching all this footage makes me want to ride out here for sure. So I'm hoping one day that I get a chance to come out to do some of the hare and hounds that are on this type of per terrain because it is just so different, and I would love to be able to rip and ride out here. Well, just imagine, you know, we are talking to, to Mikey Childress earlier today. You know, back in the day, they do 80 or 100-mile, you know, hare and hounds. He would go out and... uh Oh, maybe shy of two hours, he'd be finished with the thing. That's hauling bananas. That's hauling it. Yeah, look at this. We got yeah. a couple guys here. Hey, gonna guys. Gonna a goo pack. Gonna make sure we get some hydration going on. And uh, we're gonna hopefully continue on. These guys only got about 15 more minutes to get in there. So hopefully they realize they're gonna, they need to keep on moving. I like oh, it. Oh, actually, look at that. There we go. So that rider right there on the right is Josh Schaefer. He is one of the U.S. Hard Enduro Riders. So it looks like he's catching up actually probably with a rider that is either no longer going to continue forward or is going to ha has maybe a mechanical hanging out. So they're probably going to either help him get off course or figure out how to get him moving. And he's coming up and sweep, right? Yeah, so that gentleman there that was in the, or in the neon vest was one of our sweep riders and uh, promoters of the U.S. Hard Enduro Series. That's why we got you here, Brian to go and bring some light to some of these other riders that we don't know. There's no number on his bike, we wouldn't know who that is. Yeah, man, it's so cool to watch all these racers out here. I mean, again, we were talking about racers coming in from Europe, racers coming in from Hawaii, right, flying into the continental United States to then come into uh, Hammertown for King of the Motos. I mean, that says something, that these racers come from around the world to come to this specific race. And it's not just because it's air quotes hard enduro, right? It is about this terrain. It is about the technicality that is brought to this event. And there's obviously the level of the GPS that this is drawing a crowd. And you see riders doing the same thing for a very few other races in the United States, right? When it comes to hard enduro. Well, we have riders from Brazil. Uh, Rider from Spain, another rider from Italy, a couple riders from Canada, of course, uh, Will Reardon from Australia, and uh, it all adds up after a while. And uh, the the being world renowned starts falling into place as well afterwards. You got that right. You got that right. I think an event like Erzberg is an event that these racers would dream of going to, right? Save the money, find a rental bike, somebody that's going to have something prepped for you, or like a Romaniacs, right? I did. I talked with Nick Ferringer on the Seat Time podcast, and that was what he did. He went out there, rented a bike, and was able to have kind of someone corral him around, right? Kind of a chauffeur, if you will. And I think that that is the way to do this. Like if you have the capacity and you want to go have an adventure, have a journey, and not just need to follow a series – find different places like that like it's not a like romaniacs is hard but it has a gold class it has a, a silver class and a bronze class so someone like myself who enjoys this but doesn't really want to like try to go as fast as possible going doing the bronze class would be an amazing experience i could take my wife with me to romania right she could go hang out and do whatever she wants to do in romania i can go beat myself up in the mountains uh in the carpathian mountains right where maybe there's a, a dracula or two or vampire hanging out and we could have some fun. And I think that that's what this event is starting to do for racers around the world. They're starting to come in and rent bikes and hang out and race this event. I mean, that is pretty stinking amazing. So your take on our racing so far this weekend for today, between our prolong and coming into stage number one, where do you see the top rider being so far? 
Well, we know in the prologue that Tristan Hart, Cody Webb, and at least one or two other riders had a few GPS errors mm -hmm. during their prologue run, right? And we saw Will Riordan do a great job, right? And he was only about 15 seconds faster than those guys. So if they had a small GPS error, and he was only about 15 seconds faster. The thing is, is that it does look like Tristan Hart and Cody Webb still are going to be the fastest riders right now. Now, Will was second, you know, behind Tristan Hart, so in front of Cody Webb, but they were right there together, right? So we don't know when it was that Will really got the wheel up, if you will, on Cody Webb out there on that uh, race number one. So I still see right now that it's going to be Tristan Hart and Cody Webb's race tomorrow. But the thing is, is we do know that this is going to be an event of attrition. There are going to be many places out there where riders can get stuck. There are many places out there where riders can get lost. And as you see in hard enduro sometimes, unfortunately, a pipe could get so smashed that there is not an ability to create the power needed to be the leader, right? Or other parts could break, things like that. So there's so many things that can come into play that that's where amazing riders that are coming up, like the Cooper Abbots, the Will Riordan, Riordan, and then, of course, Ryder LeBlanc, or, or any other rider that is coming up, could have a chance to really come out tomorrow on top. Well, but I think Tristan and Cody are the ones that I'm really looking to see um, in that number one spot tomorrow. Now, I'm talking with Cooper Abbott, too. Cooper's playing it really smart. You know, instead of storming out there in front, trying to be the GPS king, he's following the tail of a couple of the other guys. And he's, he's being really smart in regards to that. The rider, we haven't really seen that much of, just a little bit, but he's having bike problems or something, some sort of issues. We'll have to find out, dig a little deeper and find out. In fact, we should have we talked to Ryder about that. But uh, Colton Haker. Right. Now, he can't rule out Colton. Right, now, he right. could you're regroup right. and put something together, and Colton could be the stormer and the surprise in this, in this entire mix. Yeah, it's interesting because we didn't really see the fire from Colton Haker that we've typically seen in the 2022 Enduro Cross Series. That's that's like where he's always shined. He just hasn't had a chance to really have a support a lot of times in the Hard Enduro Series for a long time. He has been coming a little bit more to some of the Hard Enduro Series. Um, and he's he has won King of the Motos twice before, so it's not like he's not capable. I just say that like we haven't seen that fire yet. So whatever it was that maybe was holding him back a little bit this year in the Enduro Cross Series, um, that he's kind of beyond that and past that. So you're right, like he is still easily going to be somebody that could win this event. I'm just he's going to have to bring it because we know that Tristan, Cody, and everybody else that's in the top five and six right now, they are bringing it. Bringing it and carrying it. Yeah. Of course, Colton being a two-time winner here, uh, King of the Motos. Of course, uh, Cody Webb uh, nurturing an injured wrist and uh, coming back, and he's showing his colors and still still making in that top five, which he said, if you make in the top 12, there's a possibility you could win this thing still. So he can't rule that out for sure. But, uh, you know, it's... It's a give and take. And then the youngsters coming up. You know, we had the top six. Of course, uh, you know, Cody, Cody Webb and Tristan Hart on the top of the top of the tier. Then you get the middle, the middle lads. You got Cooper Abbott and um, uh, Cooper Abbott is in the middle of the realm. I want to know how the 12 to 15 year olds fared. Our junior class. Unfortunately, no we'll we find haven't out. heard anything about how they have been doing out there. But that is the thing that blows my mind the most. We're talking to Ryder LeBlanc, right? He just turned 21, and he's been doing this for so many years. Well, there are 12 to 15-year-olds now that are on course at a hard enduro event in the United States. Just think where they're going to be in 10 years and how this sport is going to continue to progress as these 12 and 15 year olds are out there on their little 85s and probably 105s out there having a good time here at the king of the motos well in our women's class you know hallie marks took top honors in the prologue for the staging ahead of kylie sweeten and then uh, looking at the kids our top kid in this mix was ethan hutchinson from oregon and then nolan albrecht from Montana, uh, was second. Now was in the prolong. We don't have the, the results for stage number one yet. But uh, just to give you an idea of our youth riders, and then uh, third on in the prolong for our youth was uh, 
Kale Whittacombe out of Billings, Montana. Then our 45-plus 40, class, we have a handful of, well, 40-expert class here. Let's talk with them first. In a prolong was uh, Nick McGowan, one of my uh, Arizona boys. Nick also does enduro cross in the senior class. And then uh, second was Alden Anderson and Ryan Gouvier. Okay. So we're getting ready to go to commercial here and commercial break. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for hanging with us all day long for our 2023 SRT King of the Motos. How do you take your new rig from this to this? And get it ready for this. Bring it to the experts at Four Wheel Parts, where we'll transform your Bronco with the all new line of 4WP factory accessories. Whether you want to order the best parts online, shop in store, do the work yourself, or have it built by a pro, all trails lead to the truck, Jeep, or Bronco of your dreams. Because nobody knows off-road like four-wheel parts. Do your Bronco right. your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I've wanted to do and now he's just like taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs>
We are back here with the 2023 SRT King of the Motos. We're doing the roundup. We got the top five, finishing them up here. And uh, Brian, Brian Pierce and myself and Ricky Johnson earlier today. Ricky will be coming back with us tomorrow for round number three and round number two, stage number two and number three. You know, the take it today, it's been a long day, but you know what? We've had some exciting action all day long, haven't we, Brian? We certainly have, of course. We were staging up at 7 a.m. We had our race go up at 8 o'clock for the prologue. They were chilly. We were chilly, but we were all having a great time getting here started with the prologue at 2023 King of the Motos. That was just two miles, though. They came back later this afternoon, staged around noon. One o'clock, we got started racing. We're just starting to wrap that up. Three hours later, some of the riders are still out there, which is crazy. And then, of course, we are going to be starting racing tomorrow at 9 a.m. So we're going to be staging around 8 o'clock. So we'll go live on about 8.50, and we'll be ready to rock. Well, we've had some great interviews from other individuals besides our racers, too. We had, you know, Mikey Childress come in and Destry Abbott and Justin Lineweber. And, uh, and who else come up and talk with us? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we had quite a few interviews today. You are right. It was so good to be able to talk to all those racers because the thing is, like you said, we can get some of the stories by what we're watching here, but it was very hard to get those from uh, not being able to be on course like those racers were. You know, even though our great drone coverage and everything else out in the field, it's not like being out there in the field. Right. And, and these guys have the, the direct stories and what's happening. I mean, take, a, take for example, Cody Webb smashing his pipe. Right. We didn't see that. Right. We, we didn't would know. never know if we didn't we have a We had no idea that was happening, awesome. you know. Yep. And, of course... You know, Cody making it the top five as well. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, yeah. he was uh, four. Uh, no, sorry. Well, Cody Webb was there in third. Um, and we'll get a chance to wrap up everything that we, uh, with the unofficial results before we kind of close things out. So, again, tomorrow we're going to be racing. 9 a.m. is going to be race number two. Two laps. So, we're going to have about 12 miles on that first lap and 13 and a half on that second lap. So, the biggest thing that's going to happen there, most likely, that Justin was saying, they're going to be bringing in something very special for those racers on that back half of that second lap. And it's just one and a half miles on that right. second lap. Just an if added one and a half miles takes an extra hour, we know that they're in for something special. Yeah. So your take on this entire day, you, you believe it was a success to, so far? Oh, absolutely. You can tell. How many riders do we see come by us here in the booth, right, with huge grins and smiles on their faces? And they got the up. challenge. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just they got the challenge that they were looking for. They don't need to go as fast as possible to feel like an accomplished rider. They need to be given a challenge, and they need to overcome that challenge, and that is the accomplishment. So we're looking at about halfway through on that first stage today that bottleneck going up through that canyon yeah. about 20 maybe 25 riders all stopped playing and waiting for the next person to go you're sitting there and you're just standing there going gosh i wish they would go and they don't go i mean that's your time to, that's your time to rest right yeah. that's going to be our chance to do that this evening because tomorrow what are we going to be doing we're doing this again we're going to have our live show starting about 8.50 tomorrow. Again, King of the Hammers YouTube channel. So the race is going to kick off at 9 o'clock. They are going to have six hours to get through the two laps that we were just talking about, right? That 12-mile lap and that 13-and-a-half-mile lap. Oh, of course, if you are, you're going to be watching this on YouTube. There is a way to get more exclusive content. So there is going to be a join button. You can join for 24 95 what that does is that allows you to pick any of the angles that you're going to see so we were talking about all the amo amazing drone angles if you just want to watch those maybe even mute us we hope you don't want to do that but you never know that is your way to do that so a little bit more exclusive content there if you were to use that join button as you're watching on youtube also on top of that for those of you that might have a dvr or vhs recorder you might be able to record some of the action on your home set as well did you just but say a vhs recorder What's that? Chris Johnson, what are we doing here, man? It is 2023, <laughs> right? It's 11 years we've been racing dirt bikes out here, but that's at least 30 years that, ago that somebody might have a VHS recorder. You'd be surprised how many and like, people and, still And you do. also, what was your email again? 
I'm not going to tell yep, you. Yep, yep. So anybody would know his email ends in the the, the service that used to mail you discs uh, to your uh, to your mailbox. So yep. it's always a good time. 1991, though, I've had that email address. But all right, so okay. I want to let's talk to I you have a about Gmail, that. Though, also, by the way, right? So. First place, Tristan Hart. We had second, Will Riordan, of course, Cody Webb in third place. We got Cooper Abbott in fourth, Ryder LeBlanc in fifth place. Right. They're going to be about 30, 40 riders starting tomorrow, the way that they're going to line up for race number two. What are those guys going to be thinking about as that flag goes and they're jumping on the course? We have our midstream experienced riders in the mix. Right. And then we have our young guns that are starting to come after them. And they're showing their true colors each and every round as it continues on. And they they look really fresh as far as I'm concerned, right. both, both rider and will. They did look very fresh when they come in. Cooper had a little bit. He got worked a little bit, and I know Cody definitely got worked. You know, Tristan, yeah, you got worked a little bit too. So maybe these young guns have something for the older guys. You know? Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. I like it, and we're going. We're starting right at Chocolate Thunder. So as we saw with race number one today, starting that that land rush style right into that uphill climb. Well, this is an uphill rocky creek. So they are just going straight into that. So the thing is, where Tristan Hart was talking about wanting to try to get out front, not get caught by any squirrely riders, like what did happen to him, mm -hmm. they are all going to be trying to like, fight for a very small position in that creek to try to maneuver their way up, right? So they don't get wound up. They don't create a bottleneck. They don't get stuck in a bottleneck or have squirrely riders all over the place. I know some of the some of the trails are in Chocolate Thunder will have four or five wide going into one. Right. So we're looking at a lot of possible bottlenecks going up that hill. Yeah, for sure. Well, Chris, you want to throw us? You want to you want to roll us out of here? What do you want? How do you want to do this? Well, roll us out of the wheelbarrow. That's for sure. Anyway, thanks everybody for watching us and myself, Brian Pierce and Ricky Johnson, of course, this morning. And uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun covering this thing, and we. I think we did an okay job. Yeah, what do you absolutely. think? Absolutely. Pat on the back. Yep. You know, again, everybody, please share on any social media you might participate in and let everybody know what's happening out here because this is the only place in the country it is happening. And it is the gnarliest off road event in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. We'll be back at uh, about 8.50 tomorrow. So, as he said, share the YouTube links. Make sure people know to come watch it here at the King of the Hammers on YouTube. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Not all.